falling asleep. <laughs> okay, members, let's get going. No checking email. <laughs> Uh, he was moving his car. He's here, but he's parking his car. Well, let's call the meeting to order of the Board of Governors of the California Community Colleges. Um, Ms. Gilmore, please call the roll. Arnaldo Avalos. Here. Jeffrey Baum. Here. Joseph here. Belinsky, Jr. Here. Scott Budnick. Jeff Burdick. Here. Connie Conway. Iman DeLilly. Tom Epstein. Here. Cecilia Estolano. Here. Danny Hawkins. Here. Pamela Haynes. Here. Asun Khan. Deborah Malimed. Jennifer Perry. Here. Gary Reed. Here. Valerie Shaw. Here. Nancy Sumner. Here. Okay, we are going to go immediately into closed session to dis discuss the items that are on the agenda. We hope to be back out in about 30 to 40 minutes and we'll get started on the real agenda. Thanks so much. Do we really need to take anything in there? It's not on here. So I don't think so.
Okay, we are back in open session. Um, the Board of Governors of the California Community Colleges. We just met in closed session about the items agendized for the closed session and no reportable action was taken. So let's move on to the standing orders of business. Um, the first item is the Pledge of Allegiance and I'd like uh, Member Dalili, if you don't mind, in leading us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, so now we're on to the President's report, and I don't have a lot to report other than a couple of items. One is I spent most of the last two months really working through the transition, um, taking on the responsibility as president of the board. And I, I want to thank Jeff Baum for such great leadership and, and really wonderful um, friendship in this transition and providing a lot of guidance to me as I was vice president and, and coming on board as president. Wonderful suggestions about how to keep our momentum going forward. And um, really, I just hope to keep up the the wonderful feeling of collegiality that you were able to foster on our board. So I want to thank you for that, Jeff. Um, we also had an occasion, um, Vice President Epstein and I, um, to, to talk with our new chancellor and look forward to the new year. We will be talking about the Board of Governors meetings for the next year and how we might want to restructure them slightly, try to make them maybe a little bit different. But one of the, the traditions we definitely do not want to lose is the tradition of us having dinner together um, during that during our meeting. So we're gonna be working on that and we'll be enjoying our dinner tonight with folks, with a former board member, Lance Izumi, who's gonna be joining us, who's also a member of our foundation. That should be quite a pleasure. Um, I also uh, wanted to note, and you all received a notice from our chancellor about uh, the very favorable accreditation of, of City College of San Francisco and really the, the end of that um, troublesome era. So they've now been fully accredited. I'm sure the, the chancellor will be talking more about that. But I wanted to note in my president's report that this was um, a years long process that really shown some of the best elements of the chancellor's office. And I particularly wanna call out the work of um, our former chancellor, Bryce Harris, and his leadership in steering the ship through this very patiently and but very deliberately, making sure that he provided the support and the chancellor's office provided extraordinary support um, to CCSF through this period, and also our Deputy Chancellor, Eric Skinner, who continued um, to really provide important leadership through this whole process. I know many people in the Chancellor's office, I think at one point you all were spending something like a third of your time on CCSF business. That's an extraordinary level of investment in one college, but it was important, and it's good to see that we've now gotten that, that campus back on track. And that concludes my report. I want to turn it over to our new chancellor, Eli Oakley. Thank you, uh, Board President Estevano. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, apparently, um, I don't generate enough excitement because there's empty seats here. <laughs> but uh, Keep it that way. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, now I want to once again Thank the Board of Governors for this opportunity. As you mentioned, this is my first uh, uh, meeting uh, uh, as Chancellor, and it's been really a pleasure coming on board with the Chancellor's Office, uh, getting to meet um, uh, all the agency staff. We have a tremendous staff here at the Chancellor's Office. They're um, very uh, committed individuals to our colleges and to our students, so it's a pleasure to be able to work with them. It's great to work with the, the vice chancellors, uh, who many of them I've known for many years, but now have the pleasure of working with. Uh, so again, thank you for the opportunity. I also want to thank everyone in the field at our 113 colleges who have given me a tremendous welcome. Uh, thank you, uh, particularly to the students who have, many of them have reached out. Um, and uh, this is why I'm here uh, for, for our students and what they mean to the state of California. So it's a pleasure to serve this system where I was a student. Um, so um, to all the students, um, you've now met the first requirement of being the chancellor of the California Community <laughs> Colleges. You are a student of the California Community <laughs> Colleges. So I look forward to your leadership. Um, I can't help but uh, 
mention uh, my good friend and former colleague on the board of the Long Beach Community College District, Alejandro Lomelli, student trustee for the Long Beach Community College District. Welcome, Alejandro. Welcome. Um, I also want to thank um, everyone uh, here in Sacramento, the leadership of the uh, legislature, the governor, everyone has been very welcoming. Uh, and um, I'll say more about that when the budget comes up uh, thus far. We've, we've been very fortunate um, to get the support that we're getting, and I think it's a testament to how important the system is to the state of California. Um, as I'm coming in, I'm trying to reach out to as many constituents as possible to gather information about how the Chancellor's Office serves um, our 113 colleges. So I was very pleased to receive over 44, more than 4,400 responses to a survey we recently sent out to the field. So I want to thank all the faculty, staff um, who responded to that survey. Many people took a considerable amount of time to give me their thoughts, and I very much appreciate that. Um, we're gonna use surveys like that, input that we'll gather throughout the year to help shape the direction of the Chancellor's Office and how we can better support our students at our colleges, and most importantly, the state of California. Uh, having said that, um, another effort that um, I'm going to be undertaking is working with the Community College uh, uh, Foundation uh, under the leadership of, uh, of Keitha here and um, asking them to um, bring on somebody who can help us reach out to all of California to get a better sense for the strategic direction that this state needs from our colleges um, and to help us sort of paint a vision for where we need to be over the next five, six years. Um, really help us identify the challenges and opportunities our state faces and where our colleges need to be in order to, to, to meet those challenges and most importantly those opportunities. Because I think if anything, these uh, last uh, few months have showed us that our community colleges are more important than ever, not only to the future of California, but to the future of our nation. Our colleges touch more people than any other system of public higher education in the nation. We are at the center of every one of our communities. We are at the center of the challenges that many community members face. And we are at the center of where so many, so many Californians have lost touch with the economy. And it is our job, our responsibility, and our opportunity to be able to connect those individuals with good paying jobs uh, and help us move forward as a state. So I look forward to um, uh, getting more input not only from the field, from our colleges, from our faculty, from our staff, from our administrators, but also the millions of Californians that rely on our colleges and rely on our colleges for, the, for a better future. So I'll be working with the foundation to gather more of that input and we'll bring it back to the Board of Governors. Uh, we'll bring back an update in March as to where we're at gathering that input and hopefully at some point midway through the calendar year, we'll be able to bring back more information. Um, on another note, um, I want to take a moment to uh, thank um, our outgoing President of the United States, uh, Barack Obama. Um, his administration has really shined the light on community colleges for the last eight years. And I would be remiss if I didn't take a moment to thank him and his administration for all of their efforts to uh, shine the light on community colleges, to make um, higher education accessible, to more people throughout our nation uh, and to really highlight the importance of receiving a post-secondary credential. Uh, so I wanna thank him and his administration for all their efforts and I look forward to working with the new administration uh, to see what we can do to continue to strengthen our colleges, to continue to shine a light on our mission and to continue to ensure that we're in the best place to serve all Californians. Um, let me also um, take a moment uh, following up on uh, Board President Stellano's comments. Uh, City College of San Francisco, uh, I was very pleased to see the news of the uh, reaffirmation of their accreditation. Um, I am very hopeful for City College of San Francisco and particularly for the students of City College of San Francisco who deserve the very best college um, that that community can provide. And so I wanna thank the faculty, the administration, and the staff of City College San Francisco for all the work that they've poured in 
to th this uh, accreditation effort. It's well deserved, uh, and um, I look forward to continuing to work with the Board of Trustees and the leadership of City College San Francisco to, to strengthen that college. Um, that community deserves the very best college it could have, and I look forward to working with the board and the leadership there to make that happen. Um, I want to take a moment to introduce a couple of new team members at the California Community College Chancellor's Office. First, I want to introduce uh, Laura Mattoon, our new Vice Chancellor for uh, External and Government Relations. Welcome, Laura. Uh, Laura comes to us from um, the, um, the Assembly. She has been the Chief Consultant for the Assembly Higher Education Committee, so uh, she comes very well versed in uh, the opportunities that uh, face us going forward. I also want to welcome um, uh, Sandy Freed, who uh, is joining the foundation as the executive director of the Success Center. Uh, Sandy also did a stint as chief consultant to the Assembly Higher Education Committee, but more recently, uh, we took her away from UC because we're obviously a better option than, uh, than the <laughs> University of California. Uh, this is where the future's at, so welcome, Sandy. Um, speaking of the University of California, um, I want to give my best wishes to Janet Napolitano, who um, uh, was diagnosed with cancer a while ago and has been uh, going through treatment and unfortunately was hospitalized um, today. So um, our collective best wishes are with Janet. Uh, she is a remarkable lady, leading a remarkable system, and uh, I wish her a very, very, very speedy recovery because we have a meeting next week and she needs to be there. Um, and I believe that concludes my remarks. Great. Thank you, Chancellor. Um, let's move on to consent calendar item 1.1, Deputy Chancellor Skinner. President Estelano, Chancellor Oakley, members of the board, the item before you is the, uh, the uh, approval of the consent calendar, which is, includes the meetings from uh, the, the minutes from the last meeting. Are there any changes or corrections in the, minute, in the minutes? I have one clerical item. Yes. Um, Deputy Chancellor, on page five under Thomas Epstein, just White House should be two separate words. That's it. We got it. We'll clean that okay. up. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Uh, if there are no objections, I'd like to entertain a motion to approve the consent calendar. Okay. That would be Board Member Burdick, a second by Khan. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Great. The consent calendar has been approved. Okay, we're moving on to item 2.1. We're now on the action item agenda. Um, approval of contracts and grants. Again, Deputy Chancellor Skinner. All right. This next item is the, uh, the contracts and grants and pursuant to your standing orders, you have before you a series of uh, contracts and grants that are proposed. And um, I'll just comment on a couple highlights and then of course we're always available for questions on any of these items. There are a couple new programs. There's the Zero Textbook Cost yeah. Program, which was uh, established in last year's, um, or actually in the current year budget. And uh, these grants will support the development of uh, uh, degree, insert, uh, de degree programs that uh, u utilize uh, zero textbook costs. So they're, they're developing uh, open source shared uh, inf uh, instructional materials that can be used not only at the college that, that actually wins this grant, but then those, as a condition of, of the grant, those materials that will be made available widely across the system. So the idea is to address issues of college affordability by developing uh, a, a set of instructional materials that can be made available free of charge and importantly support a whole uh, degree sequence. Okay. Um, there's the, uh, the extension of the CalPass contract, which is an important contract for our system to, that um, leverages student data and builds upon agreements at the local level between colleges, K-12 schools, and, and universities to develop uh, longitudinal data on student performance. And then th that data c is used to drive local conversations about what's working and what isn't working uh, to drive uh, educational excellence. Uh, 
there's a $5 million uh, allocation for the adult, uh, the adult ed block grant, which will provide for statewide support and uh, technical assistance. So those are a few of the items that are worth noting. There are, there are uh, additional items included and uh, the items brought before the board for, its, for a vote. Okay, members, are there any questions about any of the items on the contracts list? Okay, really? <laughs> okay, <laughs> actually have a couple. Um, yeah, just, uh, just a couple. Um, one on item number two, uh, which is the digital course content, academic affairs through Allen Han Hancock Joint Community College District. It talked about the purpose of the contract was to disperse funds to one or more community colleges. I just wanted to understand, is Allen Hancock going to actually disperse out to other colleges or is this just going to be awarded to Allen Hancock? I guess that's Chancellor, Vice Chancellor Walker. Good day, everyone. So, um, Allen, for Prop 98 funds, yeah. uh, it needs to go to one of our college districts uh, and they were awarded the contract um, so they would disperse to others. So um, we have about 16 colleges, 17 colleges working uh, inside with inmate education. And so if a college needs a particular kind okay. of book, they might be able to buy it through this contract and Allen Hancock would pay the bills. Okay, great. Um, had a couple more. And then on um, item number four about CalPass, which I think is really interesting, but there's a bullet second to the bottom of the page on page 11. It talked about expanding or increasing the number of CalPass member institutions. I just wondered how many institutions are members of CalPass because it's such a powerful tool to share data, just to get a sense of that. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, I don't have the full number. I, I know there's several um, agreements with the uh, community, I'm sorry, with the um, uh, K through 12. Yeah. I mean, there's many, many districts involved there and they're, um, I believe they have about 60% of the districts covered. That's fantastic. Yeah, they, and they continue to add to that. Okay, great, thank you. And then my last question, and this is regarding the apprenticeship. This is item number seven. I've been very interested in this. I don't know if Vice Chancellor Tom Quinlivan is here, but this is a grant to develop um, new apprenticeships in fields that have not traditionally been apprenticeships. Um, and I'm just wondering if maybe once this is all done, if we could get a report. I know we get an annual report on apprenticeship, but it really would be great to hear back what were those apprenticeships in? What were the fields? And we, don't, we have a list of colleges that are participating, but we don't really know the fields that they're in. So it's really more of a request, unless you have some information. <coughs> Great, thank you so much for that report. Um, any other questions? Yes. Can, I, can I follow Member up on Avalos. that? So don't go away. Um, <laughs> so I see that there's some um, high schools there as well that we're granting, like for example, Gross, uh, Grossmont Union High School for $729,000. Can you elaborate a little more? Why are we including high schools in the conversation? education ins institutions. Uh, we run the apprenticeship program that spans both the uh, K-12 uh, uh, local education agencies as well as us. So the competition was available to both sides. So it's unusual, you're right. Great. Any further questions? All right, I'll entertain a motion on the contracts. So moved. I got uh, Member Reed and a second from Member Hawkins. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Oppose? Any abstentions? Motion approved. Okay, on to item 2.2, the Board of Governors campus visit for 2017. Uh, Deputy Chancellor Skinner. All right, uh, this item is uh, an opportunity for the, the board to discuss and, and vote on a, uh, the proposed site for the 2017 uh, campus visit. As you know, once a year, the, the Board of Governors holds one of its meetings on a campus uh, one of our 
California Community College, college campuses. And um, the, the proposal coming forth from the chancellor and from staff here is to, to hold the meeting at Santa Ana College in September of 2017. And Chancellor Oakley's had the opportunity to have some uh, initial conversations with campus leadership. And uh, it has a, a number of, of uh, aspects that we think will make a, a great uh, visit for the the chancellor for the for the board uh, meeting. One is uh, it's the, in Southern California. The last couple meetings have been up north. Uh, it is uh, a, a campus that's known for its innovative educational programs, its pathways programs. So I think it'll be an opportunity for you to see some of that up close and personal. And uh, it is. Uh, uh, the, the location also is a convenient location in, in terms of travel and uh, proximity to an airport, which is always a plus when we can fit that in. So uh, for a variety of reasons, we think it'd be a, a great place for you to have a meeting. And, and again, it's being brought forward for your uh, consideration and approval. And uh, board members also note we haven't been to Orange County in a number of years. So it was also, I think, one of the pluses to, to visit a, a school in, in Orange County. Um, Chancellor Oakley, any other comments? Uh, the other thing I would say is um, Santa Ana College is a remarkable college, and it would be a wonderful opportunity to go visit them. Great. Okay. Any discussion? Yes. Board Member Sumner. I'm just really excited. <laughs> Thank you. I'm just really excited because it's nice to have them down in Southern California. There you go. Anyone else? Yes. Board Member Baum. I just presume they, they've uh, extended a uh, an invitation to us to come. Yes, they, 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 <laughs> we're not with, arriving with, uninvited with o open arms they would very much like to, to host the board yeah the chancellor of the rancho district agree <laughs> great any other questions or comments all right um do i have a motion approving uh the visit okay member sumner second second by member hawkins all in favor say aye aye, aye. Opposed. abstentions motion approved all right, moving on to information, I'm sorry, to item 2.3, a board resolution affirming support. Um, Vice Chancellor Feast. As uh, Vice Chancellor Feast comes on up, I'm gonna say a few words, uh, Board President Stellano. Um, uh, as many of you know, there, there have been a lot of discussions um, uh, around this issue of ensuring that uh, all of our California students feel uh, welcomed in our on our campuses um, this brings together much of the um, uh, the language that has been used by our sister uh, systems at the California State University system and the University of California and um, I think we are in some ways fortunate um, uh, that the University of California has done a lot of work behind the scenes on this issue, and we've been benefiting from that work. And of course, uh, President Napolitano um, uh, helped, was involved in writing the uh, deferred action uh, uh, language to begin with. So we wanted to ensure that the Board of Governors had um, sort of one unifying voice uh, on the part of the system, uh, again, reassuring our students that um, they should continue to come to campus, they should continue to participate in their studies, and that we uh, encourage and support their um, eventual completion of whatever their educational goal is. So with that, I will turn it over to Vice Chancellor Feast. Thank you, Chancellor. President Estolano, Vice President Epstein, and board members, good afternoon. Before you is a resolution that affirms the values and principles that embrace diversity and inclusion in the California Community Colleges. These are val values that are prominently spelled out in the system's strategic plan. The resolution also voices the commitment to serve all students, regardless of immigration status. It, re it reiterates policy positions and guidance that the Chancellor's Office has provided to districts and colleges in the weeks since the presidential election, in which we have jointly articulated with our partners at the University of California and California State University. Those include support for continuing the federal program known as Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DACA, as well as commitments by the Chancellor's Office not to provide student data for the purpose of immigration enfor enforcement or creating a federal registry unless required by law. While this re resolution does not have, the binding a th have binding authority on districts and colleges, it references previous Chancellor's Office guidance on these topics. Many of our districts have already adopted resolutions si similar to the one before you, and many other local boards are eager to go on record with similar positions. And with that, I turn it over to you for your discussion. I think we have a speaker slip. 
Julie Bruno. President Thanks. Stellano, uh, Vice President Epstein and Chancellor Oakley and board members, uh, good afternoon. I just wanted to say that the Academic Senate is very pleased to see uh, this resolution and um, know that the board is supporting action on the concerns voiced by students, classified staff, faculty and administrators across all of our system. We really do want to make sure that we affirm, reaffirm, excuse me, our collective voices on inclusivity, diversity, and opportunity. We are also confident that the Board of Governors, the Chancellor's Office, and our colleagues at all 113 colleges will do everything in their power to create a safe and inclusive environment to ensure that our students continue to learn and thrive. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bruno. Uh, any more speaker slips? That's it. Okay. So we're going to open it up to some questions and then we'll entertain a motion. Board Member Baum. Thank you to, uh, for calling on me and thank you to the Chancellor's Office for putting together a, a resolution. It uh, follows on the public statements that Interim Chancellor Skinner and I both made after the election to send a clear message uh, to our, our system and our state about the values of the community college system. And so I, I'm glad that we have this opportunity to take a proactive step to uh, make a statement on behalf of the entire system. As I looked through the wording of the proposed uh, resolution, I wanted to offer some suggestions that I think will make it a, uh, a stronger resolution and seen as a positive statement of values as opposed to a political statement, uh, because I think that will serve the, the system better, and I wanted to focus it on our efforts in interacting with the federal government as a whole as opposed to working with any one individual. And so if possible, I'd like to uh, suggest some change, just some mi moderate yeah, changes to the uh, uh, resolution. And they, they start within the, uh, the fifth paragraph, the whereas, and, um, and instead of specifically speaking about the president himself, I wanted to broaden that to the entire federal government. So I, my, my suggested changes, and Karen, if you need help, I can provide the language. It would say, where. I would recommend it says, whereas uncertainty, uncertainty exists about what specific immigrations and immigration <coughs> and education policies will be pursued by the next administration, and certain individuals, not just immigrants, but individuals within the uh, community college system are fearful of deportation or forced registration based on their religion. Um, and that's one area where I wanted to do that. Certain populations? Cert or certain populations. I'm or happy to, instead of individuals. Okay. And the next one, instead of calling on, uh, where it says calling on President-elect Donald Trump, I just say call on the President-elect to preserve deferred action for childhood arrivals, which we all agree with. And then on the last paragraph on that page, it would say resolve that the Community College's Board of Governors urges the federal government to continue the deferred action for childhood arrivals. That includes not just the president, but the entire federal government. And then the, um, and so those are my word changes, uh, recommended word changes that I think will help us speak and not be seen as, as through a prism of politics, but really an aff affirmative statement of our values. Last one is, is I just wanted to get clarification, and, and I see uh, um, our legal counsel here too. There's a paragraph on the second page that talks about the chancellors uh, saying the office will not join efforts, uh, cooperate with any federal effort to create a registry of individuals. What does that mean? Because will that prevent us from collecting data about um, certain populations within our, our system like we already do uh, with respect to uh, success rates and things like that or within or individual schools, uh, individual districts? <laughs> collecting data about uh, participation in various programs that uh, serve various populations. Member Baum, the, the intent isn't to uh, alter the data that's being collected at this point. Uh, truly, the intent is to make sure that we're in compliance with existing law, existing federal law uh, under FERPA as it stands now, that we don't release personally identifiable student data um, unless uh, required by a court order or otherwise, uh, a subpoena. Uh, 
uh, or other valid <coughs> mechanisms. So at this point, the, the statements being made are, are wholly consistent with existing federal law, and we have an obligation as it stands now at the chancellor's office uh, to protect uh, students' personally identifiable uh, data that we have, uh, and we would continue to do so. So is, is the word registry what is what, because I, I just don't want us to tie our hands and our district's hands from being able to uh, continue to serve underserved populations and things like that if we uh, do that, especially as we go out for efforts to, say, increase Pell Grant participation, and that would require federal government participation in that. Uh, as um, uh, our council um, looks through his material, I also want to make the point that at the local level, there is no personal, personally identifiable information that's being collected now. It is information based on demographics, on income status. Uh, so even at the local level, they are not collecting personal uh, information for, for those purposes. So uh, I see no reason why the colleges can't continue to collect data uh, for purposes of helping and supporting uh, completion, the completion agenda. And I say this as, as a person who has a neighbor who was interned by in World War II and has, who's had, has a grandparent who was part of a registry that required an, a, uh, an emigration from uh, occupied not, um, lands during World War II. So, okay, what I would recommend is just say resolve that the state chancellor will not cooperate with efforts instead of just federal efforts, just efforts to create a registry of individuals based on protected characteristics such as that too. Is that possible to do that? It's, it's absolutely possible. And, and the reality, under again, under existing law, uh, is whether it's the federal government or a third party or any other governmental agency or other party, uh, at this point time, we would not release that personally identifiable information uh, to anyone or to any party. Um, and so uh, if you wanted to broaden the language, uh, to make it any efforts that right. would be consistent with not only the federal government, but uh, any third parties that might be trying to compile a database uh, based on protected characteristics. The reality is uh, we wouldn't be releasing the data that identified personally uh, our students uh, based on protected <coughs> characteristics uh, in any event. So that's okay. what I would recommend, that we broaden it to any effort to uh, create a registry for the purpose of identifying people by a protected characteristic. Okay, so I think I have Member Haynes. So here's what I'd like to do to continue this. Let's make this any questions, and then uh, if somebody wants to make a motion, then we can debate that motion. And we have another public comment. Okay, let me just uh, continue on. So I've got Member Haynes, and then you have to help me. Followed by Member Shaw. So I won't, I won't speak to um, some of the recommendations you made, but I did uh, also have a, a question relative to there are a number of whereases that um, what I really would like to know, since, since a resolution doesn't have force of law and is a recommendation, but there appears to be certain language in here that, that is embedded within the legal system already. So for example, if an entity came to one of our colleges and asked for certain data um, we could, we c the college could ask for a subpoena. I am I not correct in that? So, and I so are there places? I guess what I what I'd like to what I'd like to have an understanding is what is already embedded within our legal system that says we already have grounds to ask for certain things, and then what is not so that, um, that we're clear about where are those pitfalls where um, if we didn't f do something, then we would be in, um, what's the term? Um, we, would ha we would be in jeopardy of someone following a suit. Um, Member Haynes, I, I, I'm assuming that you're referring specifically to the data collection pieces? The, yes. Yes. Um, so to as to your question uh, as to when another entity can issue a subpoena, um, because that's one of the currently lawful methods for requesting uh, this type of information. Uh, entities are, are able to issue a subpoena if they're in ongoing litigation, 
uh, and certain enforcement entities, including uh, federal immigration enforcement entities, uh, have the authority to uh, issue subpoenas, uh, again, with the permission of a court, uh, when they're embarking upon their in, their enforcement activities. So, th so th in essence, this is clarifying um, for for our staff and for faculty and others that there is a process, and therefore, um, <clears throat> the feeling that you have to give up information is just a feeling, and it, it it's not necessarily required by um, by law that you just automatically do it that you can ask for further subpoenas or justifications that are within the that are embedded within law. That's correct. And and speaking for the Chancellor's office in particular, if uh, we receive a request of that nature for personally identifiable information, um, our uh, program staff uh, as a matter of course will come to uh, to my office and we will ensure that uh, the request complies uh, with applicable laws. Uh, before any data is released. I think we have board member Shaw followed by board member Belansky. Yeah, I just have a, a question to Jeff. Jeff, can you help me to understand why you want to omit the name of the president or the administration when, and, and, and uh, add federal government when it really isn't the federal government, it is the administration that's moving forward these policies? My strong feeling is that it, if, if we say the president by name in, in this current environment, our action will be seen through political lens as opposed to policy lens. And I think it's more effective and more powerful for us to make an affirmative statement about what we believe and that we do hold the whole federal government accountable, not just one individual. That's, my, uh, that's why I'm putting that forward. But the federal government is, is, is just going to enact something that the administration is telling them, but it's not the federal government. In other words, we're not, we can't indict the federal government. I shouldn't say indict, but we should. <laughs> we can't so it really is, the, it's, it's the policies of the administration. It's not the federal government. That's what I don't get. So let, let's keep moving a little bit, and then I think what we really need is get somebody to put a motion on the table to discuss it. Um, Board Member Lansky? I don't have a question, but I just wanted to once again publicly make a comment as we're working on this that uh, there are any number of community college districts that have passed resolutions in order to assist students. And I do want to call out the fact that there are many colleges that have dreamers groups and reach out and, and hold meetings with students and have been doing that for a long time, and I think they should be commended for the work they're doing to ensure that our students will be successful, documented or undocumented. Okay, so I'm gonna, um, we have one more speaker card and then we're gonna entertain a motion. Um, I have one question though. Too. Yeah, go ahead. The, um, um, just on the collection of data too, when I was board president and, and member Sumner will re remember this, I, we did get a request from the federal government about personally identifiable information for, for the purposes of military recruiting. And so there is, I guess, some precedent, precedent of the federal government asking for data on specific individuals within our system. How does this integrate with, with that? There, there are particular uh, areas, including uh, with uh, military service uh, and veterans, where there's actually already statutory authorization for that type of data to be collected. Um, and some, t some of those exceptions are within uh, FERPA, which is the overarching uh, federal statutory scheme that, that uh, protects uh, student educational data, and some are uh, in other acts. But uh, as it relates to the, the data set that you're, you're referring to, there, there's a separate statutory dispensation for that. Okay. Uh, Vice President Epstein, who is our final speaker? Uh, Larry Galizia. Larry Galizia. President Estolano, Vice President Epstein, Chancellor Oakley. I'm sorry I didn't get that card early enough to, uh, to Karen, so I apologize for that. Just You should have on your desks um, the joint resolution that was passed by the, the joint boards uh, of the league, so therefore the 21-member board representing the trustees, the 
over 430 trustees, and then the 15-member board representing the over 140 uh, CEOs or chancellors, presidents. And I just wanted to make sure that you had that wording and that you, ha you saw that uh, both policy boards of the league in its joint meeting, uh, it was, which actually took place uh, November 17th of last year, uh, passed a, a resolution on the on the same topic and I'm uh, regardless of the specific wording that comes out of uh, the motion I uh, I suspect uh, we will uh, the league strongly will support uh, your effort and thank you for your leadership on this thank you okay at this point I'm going to entertain a motion so we can keep moving along <coughs> member Baum. Can, can I move approval of the uh, resolution with the uh, revised wording that I shared earlier Okay, do I have a second? Second. Blansky. Okay, so now we'll take um, any comments, or discussion on that motion. Board Member Haynes followed by Board Member Burdick. So, um, so there's a couple of, of things. One, um, from the vantage point of a trustee that um, we just um, uh, approved uh, a resolution um, and recognizing, um, as, as a member of the Triple CT board, the, my colleagues on that particular board that were very um, concerned that um, a statement that was very precise about who we were talking about with regard to DACA students, and, um, and to hear from both students as well as from um, my colleagues, uh, trustees, um, Recognizing the fear and the anxiety among students and, um, that is not only palpable, but that there is actually um, a, 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 real, a true sense of fear that, um, and, and, and I recognize um, the concerns about, um, the concerns raised about not being political, but I think we really need to name things as they, they truly are. Um, um, and we need to be as specific about who we're talking about who and who we're really trying to protect and be as clear about that in any statement that we make. And to the extent that we take those elements away, it becomes ambiguous and then we begin to talk about who are we talking about. So we're talking about dreamers who were, who, when they place their confidential information on our campuses had the feeling that that would be confidential and that that would be honored. And now to find out that it, will, it may well not be honored, given very precise um, comments from um, the president-elect, and, and, and it has been ongoing and consistent. So I would argue for um, not passing anything that would be ambiguous. We're talking about dreamers. We're talking about um, students who, um, they should feel safe on our campuses. So, Emma Haynes, do you have specific language change? Because I think, I think you should give it a shot if you, and that would be in the, I take it the so fifth paragraph that you're I, talking about? I, you know, I don't have specific. I, 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 I just believe, we just, we, I, talking about the problem. I don't have the language, but what I would say to, um, to member Baum is that um, some of the things to dilute uh, under um, um, politics actually need to be there because it is the there it, this is will be president uh, um, president elect Trump's administration at the end of the day the buck stops with him just as the buck stopped with our current president. I think uh, board member Burdick followed by Hawkins. We're looking at a document that now has four or five substantial changes um, and still some discussion between, mm -hmm. between those. I wonder if it would be a good idea to go ahead and have the alternate document uh, distributed. Um, it wouldn't take very long for somebody to make that and, and redistribute it, maybe go on to some other item and come back to it. Well, I think we want to finish this we up today. This today. I mean, this is not a lot of changes, but um, let's take the. Let me let me ask the folks who are in the queue if you'd like to make some comments first, or but let's go through. Board Member Hawkins, why don't you go ahead and comment? Uh, thank you. I uh, 
truly uh, appreciate Member Haynes' uh, comments, but I just wanted to point out that this was broader than just Dreamers because it did specifically yes. call out registration for their religion, which could be any student, whether they're a dreamer or not. So it's already broader than that. So I don't know that we're diluting anything yeah. by making the change, and I really do support the changes. Okay. Then we have uh, Board Member Khan. So um, this is actually, it was going to be an amendment I would have introduced as language to kind of voice what Member Haynes was pointing towards. I think it's a happy median where we keep president like Donald Trump and then add afterwards um, and federal administration. So that way you cover both parties and you don't have to be fearful of a name or kind of push away from naming someone who clearly has this on their agenda. Um, to speak from a kind of different perspective also, I don't know where I heard this before, but it was once said that fear of a word only empowers it. So if you treat it the same way to a name, then I think omitting that name as it's been shown in this resolution when it was initially released as an attachment for this meeting kind of sends a clear message to our stakeholders and community that for some reason we are avoiding a, what's a serious issue by instead stating, well, in the continuum of what may happen with our system, let's just make sure the federal government doesn't you know, tread on our students' rights. Instead, it should be about we have someone who has actively proposed things that are against our values as a system. So let's stand up to that. I, I think that's the core of my sentiment. Okay, hey, Member Dalili. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, I think just getting out of the nitty-gritty wordage, I uh, personally want to say it's an honor to be on a board and part of a system uh, that values inclusivity, equality, um, and many of the other things that we've seen in this past month that uh, we've had our president-elect. Um, I would like to support the wordage that Member Haynes and uh, Member Shah have brought up, and I think it's I, th I think it's important um, to display to our students that we are willing to take a stand to the figurehead that they know. Many students um, are, are, are not afraid of the federal government, and when they watch the debates and uh, when they watch the Twitter news clips, they're not looking at what the federal government is saying. Uh, there is one man, and that is our president-elect, um, who, who people... Uh, get worried about and I think it's important that we show as our system that we are willing to stand in front of uh, our president-elect and as as much as we can remaining apolitical uh, I think it's important that we stand by our original resolution if we have board member Reed followed by board member Sumner you know seven or eight years ago this board was presented with the dreamers and it was a controversial issue at that time and a number of us stood behind this effort for the reasons being pointed out today. But I want to remind the board, too, that there hasn't been an action taken. This is a, a comment that's been made by one individual during a campaign. And many of the um, parties that are involved in this have already spoken to the fact that they don't uh, support this effort going forward. And I think that, you know, to put our board in this kind of position, I'm in favor and have voted in the past for, for this DREAMers, and I believe very strongly that every student in our community college system has a right to go to school and would be better for our society to have those students uh, with their diplomas regardless. But I, I really disappointed if we continue to politicize this issue when the issue doesn't exist. If it exists, then I think there should be certainly a call to action. But I think to, to provocate this, to push it forward, and to make it a, a, a political issue is a shortfall on our part. We need to reach out and work with these administrations, regardless of which party we're affiliated with, for the benefit of our students. And I just really hope you think about this kind of action. And I think um, Jeff's uh, modification to this uh, certainly um, speaks to that, and I certainly like the league's uh, position that they took. I thought that was very responsive. But I'd just like to remind the board that at this point, um, the administration, the president-elect, has not taken any action, and I think this is a little bit premature. But I certainly stand behind the students, and I hate to divide this board. It was divided one time before, and it was very detrimental to this system and to the system's office. Board members were, were, were taken off this board that were probably the best board members we've ever had. 
and I hate to see this become this kind of an issue. And so I hope we we're, think responsibly before we vote today. Thanks. Board Member Sumner. I don't need to say anything now. I think Gary said everything. I was going to make some, uh, some comments, but I think Gary pretty much spoke for what, how I feel, too. Are there any other comments? Because uh, I'm going to make some comments. If, if you know, Go ahead, Jeff. Last. All, all I would say is that w my uh, amendments are in no uh, way intended to actually weaken this resolution. It's actually in order to strengthen this resolution and strengthen the voice of this system for the values for which we stand. Because I don't want to see us um, categorized like that we're taking just a reactive posture to what we, we've heard on the campaign rhetoric and what we've heard uh, in, the so, uh, in the social media sphere. So I think this will make it a stronger resolution. I think our chancellor has a comment to make. Uh, the only thing I would add um, to the extent that it's helpful is, uh, first of all, um, uh, speaking for the 113 colleges and our 2.1 plus million students, I think the more that you can be clear, the better. Um, because as, as these issues trickle down through the system, um, the more ambiguity there is, uh, the, the, the less clear it is to those on the ground who are, who are looking to us to, to find clarity. Um, not trying to suggest one way or the other whether this resolution go, should go one way or the other, but just to the extent possible, um, seek clarity in what we're saying uh, to the field. Um, two, that um, uh, please have faith that um, that I and my team will and have been reaching out to the new administration, um, trying to do everything possible to establish a good relationship between the California Community Colleges and the new administration. I've had very positive conversations thus far with members of the transition team, soon to be no longer the transition. Um, so in no way do our actions on the ground suggest that we are antagonistic to the new administration, but we are trying to work with the new administration um, uh, and to be as clear as possible with the new administration about um, California's um, value, the way California values all of its students. Uh, and um, so um, to the extent possible, I, I think as we work through this, the more that we can be clear, the better off all 72 boards can re respond to all all the organizations that are looking to this body to to find some direction uh, would be helpful. Great. Okay. So here's my suggestion. I, I I appreciate all the comments by the board members, and I think it's a testament to how seriously we take our position on this board of governors. How important it is for us to signal to our students that this is a system that that not just preserves their rights, but celebrates their diversity, celebrates their contributions to our great state and to this nation. Um, as a result, I, I have a suggestion on language. I, too, um, believe that it's important for us to keep this clear, and I take to heart Board Members Haynes' statement about, I think you're reaching to this populations that would be affected. I actually want to expand that language a little bit because this is not just about immigrants. This is about religious freedom as well and other protected statuses. And so I've suggested about that. But I also do appreciate what board members Baum um, and Reed state about politicization. And I do think we can be very clear about our concerns, clear about who we're messaging to without um, engaging in, a, in sort of a personal call out. So here is my suggestion on language. And um, and if board member Baum accepts it, um, then we can do an up or down vote, or we could take a recess and try to re reframe the language. But I think we're almost there. So on the fifth um, paragraph, I would say, and I'll just read to you the language I would go with, whereas great uncertainty exists about what specific immigration and, in and education policies will be pursued by the new federal administration, and immigrants and others within a community college system are fearful of deportation or forced registration based on their religion. That is what I would make the fifth paragraph read. <clears throat> then in the sixth paragraph, where Board Member Baum suggests called on President-elect Donald J. Trump, he um, calls for deleting that. I'd s this is actually a restatement of what we had done before. So I think we can retain that language because it's merely a restatement. It restates what, what our three systems actually did. It's a factual statement. So we can retain that language. And then in the last resolved on page 25, 
I would say that the California Community College's Board of Governors urges the new federal administration to continue, and then the rest, the rest of it would be retained. Um, that's my suggestion. I think it achieves both goals. It broadens the group of students that we're speaking to and we're trying to assure that we're, we are in full support of their educational and career aspirations. But it also restates the fact that um, right after the election, the three leaders of our systems did make a statement to address to the president-elect, but it also looks forward to a new federal administration. And quite frankly, we don't even know who the secretary of education is going to be just yet. I mean, they have the administration is not even in place yet. So I, too, want to be hopeful and work collaboratively. I happen to believe that our mission as community colleges is something that crosses all partisan lines and that every member of our political spectrum can get behind because we are talking about investing in the future of our nation. And I have no reason to suspect that we won't have that commitment from the federal government. I think our chancellor is correct. Um, President Obama and his administration highlighted the enormous contributions of the community college system nationwide. And I think it's created a momentum and a support for our community colleges that is very, very broad and probably stronger than ever before. So strong that I imagine that this incoming administration will want to continue that momentum. So that is my suggestion. Board Member Baum, would you be willing to accept a friendly amendment? I want to confirm that we addressed a, a letter to uh, the president-elect himself uh, in that. So I just, uh, so by person, by individual, we did that. That is correct, yes. Right, that's fine. The, uh, the one other question is, I just want to clarify, when we talk about creating a registry of individuals, that is a very specific thing that we're talking about for the purpose of classifying individuals by these protected characteristics for, for whatever purpose. So I want to understand the legal definition so that we can make it help understand that it's a very narrow purpose for this registry that we're objecting to, not just the collection of, of data like for selective service purposes or, mili or military it, recruitment. It's purposes. essentially a legal term of art among the civil rights community, if I, am I correct? Correct, that's correct. Yeah. Has it been defined? There's not a universal definition, but I, I, I think in, in part, uh, the language that you see here uh, reflects uh, some of the, the, the positions that, that had been taken during the, the presidential campaign as far as uh, creating databases of individuals of particular religious affiliations and otherwise. Because obviously, as you mentioned, a, a resolution is not binding. It's uh, uh, the resolu It's it's a statement, and so if, if it's defined in those characteristics for in the purposes that we discussed, I would still, again, try to say then we should make it stronger that it, we will not join any effort, uh, where we will not cooperate any yeah, effort. I think that's fine uh, yeah. to create a registry. I think that that's yeah. I because I I think it, once I'm very sympathetic to what uh, Member Reed said. Until I'm confronted with a policy proposal that uh, that cuts to the heart of our values, it's hard to react in a in a preemptive way. But I do want to. Uh, I agree with others that we should make a clear statement to our. Uh, Jake. To our. I just want to clarify where where things stand right now as far as the language on the resolution. I believe, Member Baum, you're on the second page, second uh, resolved clause. Uh, your proposed changes uh, would make that statement read resolved that the state chancellor's office will not cooperate with any efforts to create a registry of, in, of individuals. And I don't believe, President Estelano, that your proposed friendly amendments would change that in any nope. way. Okay, that's fine. You accept? I, ac I accept the friendly amendment. Okay. All right. Is the seconder accepting it? Who is the seconder? Member Belansky, need an agreement? All right. Any further comments before we... Take a vote. Okay. Yes, Member DeLilly. One more possible amendment, since we were all discussing, the one thing we can all agree on um, is the inclusion, uh, besides immigration status, on the third resolved on the second page, uh, would it not be beneficial to have that sentence finish, have an opportunity to receive an education in the community college system, regardless of immigration status and any other protected characteristics yes. um, listed above? protected status. Jeff, you good with that? Joseph? Okay. 
Thank you, Member Dalili, for that expansion. All right, Board Member Haynes. So, um, are, are you going to ask for a vote based on what we've dis just discussed, or will this body get a chance to see it um, in written form before we get to vote on it? Well, I was proposing that we just go ahead and vote. I mean, I read them out, but if you really want to have it printed out and there's a strong feeling on the board, we can do that. It's an important statement. I, just, I feel like we're close. I, I feel like we're close too, but um, I'm a visual, I'm a visual learner, and so to have it in writing would be extremely helpful Let's do it. for me. Okay, we'll bring it back. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Let's move on then. Thank you, Jake. Just give me the high sign when we have it ready. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so we're moving on to the governor's budget update. Vice Chancellor Rodriguez. As uh, Vice Chancellor comes up, uh, I just want to take a moment to thank the governor, the Department of Finance, um, the entire team over there for um, working with us to put a focus on community colleges in this budget. As we've heard from the governor's um, uh, uh, press opportunity, um, revenues in the state of California are beginning to not be as robust as they once were. Uh, that obviously is a concern to us. Um, but um, we are hopeful that the um, uh, Department of Finance and the governor will continue to put, place a premium on our students and we will continue to work with them uh, as hopefully the budget improves. Um, and so with that, turn it over to Vice Chancellor Rodriguez. Thank you, Vice President Estelano, or President Estelano, uh, Vice President Epstein. Give me a promotion, man. <laughs> Old habits die hard, uh, members of the board. Um, because of the timing of the budget and the uh, calling of the publications um, for the board meeting, uh, I've instead opted to provide two documents to the board. The first one is a chart of all the adjustments where we were last year, or in the current year budget, what the governor has proposed for next year, some differences, what the board um, has uh, uh, requested in their budget, requ in our budget request. And then this document, this, this narrative that kind of goes through and explains at a high level, some of the adjustments. Um, so keep in mind that on January 10th, the governor every year is required by January 10th to release the budget. Uh, by February 1st, the governor is required to release a trailer bill. So some of these proposals that are going to be um, built out more like a program, we do not have all the spe specific requirements yet because we do not have the corresponding trailer bill. That's still being developed. The administration um, on some more than others is asking for our input on that and so we're still working with them. So today will be a high level kind of overview and, and as the months go on, as the budget process picks up through the spring, we'll get more and more information and we'll continue to keep you informed. So I'll go through the narrative document very quickly and then uh, open it up for questions. So um, consistent with what Chancellor Oakley had mentioned, um, after years of seeing significant increases in Proposition 98 and in state general fund revenues, um, we begin to see not a decline, but a less of an increase than previously projected, um, which is fairly consistent with what we've seen um, at the federal level as well. We're reaching a um, level of full employment, um, where we have fully climbed out of the hole we had once dug ourselves into as an economy, and so we can expect modest increases going forward. So for the large, um, most significant increases that we've seen in our budget, um, the first two items under educational services come to mind. The first one is $150 million one-time grant to implement guided pathways at our colleges. As we talked about, uh, or as, as I just mentioned, the trailer bill will carry the bulk of what's in this program. What we have right now is a, um, a roughly a paragraph that's been contained in the governor's budget summary. It talks about integrating the work that we've already done um, and, and really sinking our roots deep into that. And so it's one-time money, um, how it all works, if there's a grant application, you know, who, which colleges get what, that'll be forthcoming and we'll have plenty of time to discuss that and debate that as a system. Um, the second part is a $20 million one-time augmentation for an innovation award. Um, this year's budget and the budget two years ago uh, include, has included money for, for an innovation awards program. Both of those instances, there's been an outside committee of which member Avalos has been a part of and uh, the previous one and the current one, uh, President Estelano is our community college representative on. This 
in the budget, at least the way it's laid out so far, is that and as opposed to an outside committee, it will be brought in-house into the chancellor's office. The chancellor will have broad discretion over the priorities of those grants and the scoring of those grants. Um, so, which is something that you know we, we've mentioned that we'd like a, if it's gonna be Prop 98 dollars, it's gonna be specific to our system, us having more control over it would be a good thing. Um, there are 1.48% COLA for many of the categorical programs that have continuously received COLA. In addition to that, a 1.48% COLA for our apportionments item. That will be updated in May to reflect whatever the federal implicit price deflator is, the, 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 what, what the state officially uses for COLA. So this is just an initial estimate. Um, a 1.34% increase to access. This will go out on the growth formula that considers both demographic needs locally and then the propensity to grow um, for the uh, district. A $23.6 million increase for a base operating adjustment. Um, two years ago, we received about $267 million for this. This year's budget received $75 million for it. So 23.6% is a little lower than the system's been used to. Something that I think we're gonna hear continue, uh, to continue to hear more about going forward. The next two initiatives from the technology in the technology area are, are, are um, requests this board made and that have come from, um, that's, that are gonna support the, the, the tech initiatives that we currently have at our office. The first one is purchasing Canvas on an ongoing basis for our institutions. The first year of the online education initiative uh, provided funding for us to purchase a uh, learning management system. It, it was heavy on the front the first year on one-time costs. We had worked with the administration and made a case that it's in the best interest for us to purchase it at a state, not only because it creates a common platform for our students, but also because it's just more efficient. We get to use our economies of scale. So that money will be able to buy a learning management system for on the out years forever until the money goes away for our, for our system. Six, six million dollars for the first two years of an integrated library program. This will make sure it's consistent with uh, the, um, the online education proposal. This will allow our students to have a, a common feel when they're doing their course catalog and research. Um, on the facilities and equipment front, we have uh, 40, roughly 44 million dollars for deferred maintenance and instructional equipment. Similar to past years, you can use it all for deferred maintenance, you could use it all for instructional equipment or any amount in between. And there's no matching dollars as there was in the past years. Um, and then 52 million for the Proposition 39 program. One thing that I think you'll hear more about as well is that this governor has been great um, uh, about making sure that um, we receive our you know quote unquote fair share of the Proposition 98 split. Um, his budgets almost every year have included us at our 10.93% or above, and so we're thankful for that. Um, this year, because of some of the priorities they wanted to fund on the K-12 side, we, in the budget year, in the proposed budget year, we are lower than that 10.93%. That difference is roughly $45 million. Um, we're working with the administration on that. It's a concern for us, and they know that. Um, and they've been very kind to hear our, our thoughts so far about um, if there's new growth that that they're open to a discussion about putting more of that towards us. And so that way at the May revise and at the final budget act, hopefully we'll get back to that 10.93% split. Those discussions are ongoing. I think you'll hear concern from the field and, and we're doing our part here. Um, on the back page, uh, the governor um, chose to fund only five of the uh, capital outlay projects that, we, that this board approved. We submitted 29 projects over and uh, they've picked five and they focused those on health and safety programs. Now, I think the administration, just like with all long-term debt or general obligation bond debt, there's a um, debt service associated with that. And I think the governor is seeing, is concerned about the, the direction of revenues and concerned about adding more debt onto the state budget after that. That's a discussion that we're going to have to continue to um, have over the spring about getting additional projects in there. Will it likely end up at 29? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, we're hoping to get it higher than five, um, and that's something that you're going you're gonna to continue to hear about. Um, the governor's budget also wants to increase the capacity of our office. They provided two new executive level staff for us. We're thankful for the increase in capacity, um, and we'll, we're going to continue to work with the administration over the spring and the legislature as well to figure out how to best utilize those positions and possibly even more come the May revise. Um, one thing of note um, that's going to get a lot of attention is that 
Um, while our students, besides the students that are in those 15 pilot projects uh, for baccalaureate degrees, are not able to share in the middle class scholarship program, the governor has proposed to eliminate the program. Do those monies get reinvested back into uh, financial aid programs? Are they invested somewhere else? Will our students benefit um, from any other, f any other sort of reinvestment into the Cal Grant program? All questions that remain, I think this is going to be something that's going to be a, uh, a sensitive issue, particularly in the assembly going forward. And so we, we included a few notes that we've sent to the field at the bottom, um, just to recognize that um, you know, these, these large years of growth in Prop 98 are likely behind us until a recession. So it's important to take care of what we know is on the horizon. Um, in addition to the roughly 400, uh, I think the number is actually 410 million that we'll see in employer pension costs, so, so school or community college district and pension cost increases uh, until 2021, CalPERS, because of um, an effort to try to reduce the volatility in their investment portfolio, has moved their assumed rate of return from about 7.5% to 7 so what that's going to do is, in, you know, likely increase. Um, and since then, they've actually come out with um, estimates that, you know, fairly significantly increase the employer contribution rate. So that four hundred million dollar number will will go higher. And we haven't done all the calculations yet. And we want to wait until something official comes out. But it'll be it'll be signi fairly significantly higher. Um, and so, with the base increase that we received so far, with the monies we received in this budget, with the hope that we'll receive more dollars for a base increase going in the May revise. It, it's a very good time to start really for the colleges considering how they're going to deal with those increases going forward. We have dollars now. When the recessions happen, those pension cost increases will continue to kick in even if we don't have dollars to pay for them in the state budget. So taking care of it now while we know we have the dollars is a really important thing. And then also we talk about the ongoing nature of some of these funds, uh, some of the big investments we've already made that we're still as a system digesting. We're still digesting some of these adult education programs, um, student success, student equity, um, strong workforce dollars. Our system's still f getting those um, normalized into our, on our ongoing budgets, making sure that we're making investments that move the needle to ensure that we get those programs going forward. So those, that's a quick summary of it. I'm happy to answer any questions. Chancellor Oakley. Yes, just to add just a, a few comments. Um, Vice Chancellor Rodriguez made a very important point about ongoing increased costs that we know are coming and um, plateauing, if not declining, revenues over time. Um, we need to be very conscious and continue to communicate with the field that this is going to put a strain on local budgets. Uh, we will see deficit budgets, if not this year, in future years. So we have to do our best to send very clear messages to the field that, uh, you know, this is a time when we need to ensure that our colleges are um, fiscally prudent. Um, we need to ensure that we don't get into a situation uh, in a few years down the line when we're repeating the same uh, mistakes that uh, we had to make uh, during the recession where we're actually cutting courses um, at a time when our students will need them um, more than ever. So um, we will be working together in the chancellor's office to send these messages early and often. Uh, and so anything you all could do to continue to echo that message uh, would be appreciated. Um, and of course, as, uh, as the vice chancellor said, we will work with the administration to try and uh, ensure that uh, we get our fair share of Prop 98. Uh, it's very important to our system. Uh, it's very important to the initiatives we have ongoing, and it will have a direct impact on our students if we don't get our fair share. Great. Thank you. So board member comments. I have board member Khan in the queue, followed by board member Sumner, Reed, and Avalos. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Just one hand, sir. <clears throat> First, I want to thank you, um, Vice Chancellor Rodriguez. It's a tough seat you sit in, and it's hard to deliver bad news when it comes. It's great when the good news comes. So um, thank you for taking on that duty. I just wanted to ask you, though, underneath technology, the $10 million provided, does that account for redundancies that exist for those districts that already have, for example, Canvas district-wide? Like, did we go into that level of negotiation where we say, hey, uh, we have probably, I don't know, 10, 15 districts that are already engaged in your product. Is there a way we can bring this number down because we're already sort of with you? Like I worked with the common course management software team that selected Canvas. And 
I don't know, personally, they seemed pretty open to that kind of negotiation. So did that happen? Yeah, the the, the price that we'd be getting for, and obviously that, you know, uh, this would you know go through a competitive process and all that, but the price that we would be getting would uh, be a bulk purchase price. So we'll be leveraging the economies of skills when we get it. So if an institution is on some other platform, um, they would once their agreement ran out, they would be able to use the savings that they had the college had been used, the paying for uh, and jump onto our license, our statewide license. So there'd be local savings. Board Member Sumner, followed by Board Member Reed. Well, I know you know which one I'm going to ask about. <laughs> so I, I have a question. Under So the Veterans Resource Centers, the Campus Safety, Mental Health, and Student Needs, the amount that we requested, there was nothing funded for that, correct? Correct. So there's no funding for veterans or mental health or campus safety. Can they apply with the educational service at $150 million? So are they expected then to apply for some of that money? With the limited resources they already have and the lack of some trained staff or professional development for them, how we as a board, can we help them? Because this was a great conversation that we had that I'm actually sitting on this board very sad. These are important, especially as you look right now, what's going on, especially safety on campuses. Mm -hmm. This is a huge thing and with veterans and mental health. Correct. Yeah. So um, so there's certain there's certain issues that uh, we will engage the administration on. Obviously, we sent the board request over. Um, I think based on, you know, uh, the way the governor sees the world, he, he provides, he's more of a fan of providing discretionary dollars with the expectation that the institutions are going to do what best serves their students. And so, you know, I think likely we weren't going to see anything in the governor's budget related to a lot of these specialty programs doesn't mean our system doesn't care about them, doesn't mean this board doesn't care about them. Um, having said that, I think as we move forward in the process, as the legislature starts to um, uh, put their mark on this budget, those are things that uh, the assembly and senate leadership, you know, they voice concerns about, they ran bills on. At the end of the day, the senate and the assembly are both going to get, get to put their um, mark on this budget, and so we're hoping to guide them to make those investments in some of these key areas, particularly veterans resource centers or you know, restoring part-time faculty um, programs. Those are some of the areas where the, we think we could probably work a little bit easier with the legislature on. And so it's not that this budget's going to be the final budget uh, and not, not to lose hope that some of these things are going to be funded, uh, but in, in all reality, it's, it's probably going to be a little bit easier working with the legislature on these ones. And one thing I, I would, I would want to note, um, uh, the budget does include, um, which is, um, it's, it's kind of more, sometimes goes without saying, but I think it's a point that the administration is trying to make, which is, you know, student equity dollars can and should be used to appropriately resource uh, disproportionate impact related to veterans. And so a Veterans Resource Center is the way they're going to do it, and that's great. But there's specific language, and it's, it's already consistent with what's in law, but it's, it's a more, more of a call out. I think it's important to them how it operates locally. Is it what we initially um, wanted? No. And so, but we'll continue to work on that. All right. I have Board Member Reed followed, followed by Board Member Avalos, then Board Member Volansky, and Board Member Hawkins. Well, I, to piggyback on, on, on Nancy's comment, I, I think that this board in the near future should reprioritize and, and, and address this veterans issue because it's been at the top of our list for a number of years, and I don't think that we should uh, go quietly into the night. And, I, and, and um, at the appropriate time, I think we should get this back up on our priority list. You know, I've been very concerned for a long time about PERS and STIRS on the unfunded liability to the state. And for the life of me, I can't understand why in the budgeting process that the unfunded liability isn't considered a debt and carried so on the budget. And, and I don't think this $400 million is even going to come close to restoring PERS to a whole issue. And the other issue is, is that STIRS, and I understand a number of school districts, is, is raising their contribution level to something like 19% of pay in the next year or two on the employer side and 11 or 12 percent, so like 31 percent of pay will be going towards retirement because it's so willfully underfunded. What le why I bring this up is that when we were hearing the testimony from San Francisco Community College, 
it was pointed out that that system had for a number of years deferred their payments into the retirement system and they were on the verge of, of being uh, bankrupt. And they said that they would reprioritize and begin restoring some of that funding. And one of the concerns I've had on this board is where does our responsibility as a board stop and where does it end? Because it seems like in the case of Compton, for those of you that were here when we address that issue to San Francisco, will the next one be the retirement system? And you know, we have reports on full-time faculty versus part-time adjunct faculty. We have the 50-50 rule. Why aren't we addressing these these issues like unfunded liability in these in these districts that we have throughout the state? Or or is that not our responsibility? I don't know. But I think it's like the tail wagging the dog. We're going to wake up here one day and find that some of these districts are bankrupt because they can't service their debt on their retirement. Got it. So there's there's two issues. Uh, the first one is um, this governor uh, um, has done a tremendous job, and, and this legislature as well, as it was not an easy vote for them to make on, on the Sturge side. So, so PERS has a board that sets their own policies. Stur STIRS is done by the state. By state policymakers, uh, they have both, um, uh, at the urging of the administration and with the support of the legislature, created um, in increased rates on on employees, employers, and the state has kicked in a share as well. Um, so those that that's kind of the three-legged stool. All, both systems will roughly be fully funded within 30 years, or 32, or 34 in that range, which is um, it's a good step given how far they were previously underfunded. And so the way that we do that, the, the way that the, the districts pay is through these contribution rates. So we think that, you know, as long as the investments continue to hit their marks, which, you know, some years they'll be a lot higher, some years will be a lot lower, the systems should be on, are on the right path to fully being fully funded over a 30 year period. Um, so I think we're okay there. There's also local debt. Um, and I think what you're seeing is a lot of colleges, the, the biggest one is the other post-employment benefits, so the, everything besides pension costs. That's an issue for every local government throughout the nation. Um, colleges, for the most part, are, are doing the right thing um, and using one-time dollars to pay for that. Um, we have, in, in our um, Institutional Effectiveness Partnership Initiative, we have a um, one of the financial metrics now um, that's going to be either this year or next year is going to be dedicated on how, what percent of funded um, the institution has. So, if the institution has assets or you know investment account that's about half of their long-term liability, then they'll get 50%. And so they could set a target that over the next two, three, five years we want to get to 60% and 80% and 100. You know, so they can do that. So I think we're we're monitoring it. We think we have a a, a reasonably sound method of monitoring those debts. And then also at the state level, it feels like the state has taken care of the long-term liability in the pension systems. But you're right; it's it, it, the way part of the way they're doing it is by ramping up employer contribution costs. And so while we have money, general operating increases. That's why the stress is we need to make sure that those dollars are taking into account those on those increases that we know are coming forward. <clears throat> Okay, we have a, three more board members in the queue and a couple of public comments. Um, board member Avalos, followed by board member Blatsky, and then board member Hawkins. Thank you, thank you very much, um, uh, Vice Chancellor Rodriguez. <clears throat> Question for you, what, what's the total budget of, of the governor's budget for community colleges this year, for 2017-18? It's about, it's about eight billion. Eight billion? Okay. Um, what, what was, when you, when you got the, when you saw the governor's budget, what, what was your biggest surprise from what we proposed to what, what the government proposed? Um, my biggest surprise, uh, I don't know, uh, I, it's, I think because we've, we have constant conversations, I probably wasn't too surprised about anything at this point. So, um, they, this governor and this Department of Finance have been really good about keeping us informed of what they're thinking along the way. Uh, keep in mind the budget's a fluid, pro a fluid process. Mm -hmm. Um, we're going to, I mean, I feel like, you know, for instance, on the, you know, the food security issue or, you know, that wasn't, that didn't garner nearly as much attention now as it did two years ago. 
and now everybody's talking about it. Um, you know, for instance, we got money for guided pathways. Three years ago, that that wasn't a huge huge issue, but now it is. And so, um, you know, I think the constant conversations we're having with finance didn't cause me to have a, a huge concern or a huge surprise. Okay, I mean, for me, um, you know, when I look at the the apportionment on base increase, uh, when there's a hundred hundred seventy six million dollar difference, that to me is a surprise. When I look at um, the full time faculty hiring, uh, where we proposed a hundred million and the government didn't come in with anything, that to me is another example of surprise. I mean, to me, what I'm saying is, again, when I you know when we had the discussion to begin with, the first time it was brought up. There, there's some big differences in approaches, right? And that to me causes surprise. So, like I mentioned last time, if there's a way to understand why or how and you know what our process does and what the government proposes, it seems like there's a misalignment in certain areas. And so that's just what I want to make sure that we're trying to think about is that how do we get more alignment? Or maybe just you know we expect it to be <coughs> misaligned and that's okay too. I, I think that's, I was gonna say, I just, go ahead, go ahead, Chancellor. Um, uh, board member Avalos, I mean, that is something that we are going to continue to work on. Um, uh, obviously, there is a challenge between the alignment in the direction that the system wants to go, which is informed by the 113 colleges who may or may not have any interest in being aligned with the governor, um, and what we here in Sacramento need to figure out the alignment. And Mario does a wonderful job of trying to gain that alignment with, with finance. Uh, but we are going to continue to work on that. I think there are signs that that is happening, um, that they recognize the need to put money behind uh, uh, guided pathways, for example, because, and we'll hear more about guided pathways, so I don't want to steal uh, Vice Chancellor Tennis' thunder, but this is an opportunity to really um, braid together and leverage all the investments that have been made because. What we do know is that there are significant investments on the table already, whether it be uh, the equity funds, student success um, uh, funds, um, basic skills, um, strong workforce. All these initiatives have been funded separately, and what we're trying to do now is take the opportunity to bring all these investments together on the ground and make them have the impact that we expect them to have on the ground. And so it's an opportunity that we can't lose because there is not going to be further investment has been um, recognized already. But, um, you know, I, I, I take your point uh, very seriously. Uh, we need to help drive that alignment between the system and the governor's office, and we'll, we're going to do everything we can. Um, we're going to do uh, as much as possible to communicate with the field about where those disconnects are and how can we uh, close them, and we're going to work with our other partners in the system uh, on their advocacy so that we can help close them uh, with the legislature. Great. Okay. We have board member Belansky followed by board member Hawkins, and then we're going to open it up to public comment. Just to ask some questions so I better understand how this all rolls out. But for instance, like with the pathways, the guided pathways, uh, saying it has to come out in the trailer bill, what will they rely on to put together the bill? Will it be the experience of, say, the three community colleges that get the national awards and what has been successful, as opposed to legislators just writing something and... Yeah. So you're going easy on me today. I, I appreciate that. Uh, no, I, I think a, a mix of um, uh, what, you know, the governor's office and the Department of Finance uh, have a goal that they want to achieve. Exactly how that goal is implemented, uh, will they seek our help? They have been seeking our assistance, and I think they're going to continue to do so. Are they going to talk to other state uh, policy think tank organizations? Yes. Federal policy and think tank organizations? Yes. Will they reach out to individual institutions that they think have um, people that uh, are experts on this? Yeah. So it's kind of going to be all of the above. Um, our hope is that uh, whatever, you know, consistent with pretty much every initiative that we've ever gone through, the less restrictive that these initiatives are in the state law is would be beneficial to us and that you know we can take their general direction and implement the program in a way that's benefits our system the most so 
And the Innovation Award program, will there be input, do you assume, from the Board of Governors when that money is finalized? Because it's, I mean, it does say uh, that the Chancellor will select the focus of the grants. I think there's two ways. The, either the input's um, taken directly from state statute or it's the input's you know, that the Board of Governors shall do this or the input's taken um, uh, through our chancellor communicating with the board um, or through forums like this. So I think it's uh, something that is remains to be seen exactly how we'll do it, but the board will definitely be informed of all those um, decisions. And the two technology pieces, I hope that uh, faculty, particularly the Academic Senate, uh, will be involved in what that looks like given the amount of effort that they've put into it already. And that, you know, actual librarians will be involved with the integrated library system because they've been asking for that for a long time because of the high cost of library systems. So I hope that the experts are the people that are allowed to get involved. And the only other final question, or a uh, final question is, how does it get decided what the two additional executive team members would be in the chancellor's office? On, on the faculty involvement, the, the, the proposal, um, while it came from this board and, and, and from our office um, for the integrated library service, it came from the faculty association, so they will have um, involvement. On the online education initiative, faculty and academic senate have, have inclusion into that you know, kind of committee, so I think we're fine there. Um, uh, the two executive positions, were st it's something that we're still gonna be working with the administration on. Um, it, they didn't say exactly what areas they'd work in, um, and so it's something, it's an initial proposal. Um, we haven't quite dug down that deep into where what they want us to initially focus on, but I think they're going to work with us on those two new positions, and if we can get any more. Okay, Board Member Hawkins. Thank you, President Estolano. Um, Mario, you said the total just a little bit ago was approximately eight billion. That's about right. How does it break out with ongoing versus uh, one time? Right now, ooh, we got a hundred fifty. Somewhere uh, around um, between two hundred and two hundred and fifty in that range, and I, I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but we can get you that breakdown. Okay. Um, this governor just. So just for some background, he's he's um, he's always carried around 200, 250 pretty much every year in the ongoing year, the budget year, mm -hmm. with one-time dollars, and that's a way for um, it's, you know it's a, you know some it doesn't allow you to make the every investment you want to make every year, but it's a smart it, it's a smart way to budget going forward. Well, so. at that level, at at the local level, it's kind of hard to build a program or veteran centers or do the professional development if it's only one-time money. So while I support that effort and encourage that we're going to be going at the legislature, I really want to echo Member Sumner's and Member Reed's statement about the Veteran Center and the con component of mental health and professional development. But we really need to focus on that being some level of ongoing funding. Otherwise, we're never going to address these issues for our system. Correct. Okay, we're going to move on to public comment and members of the board. After this item, we're going to take a brief break. Okay, take it away, Vice President. That's good to hear. Uh, Jeffrey Michaels and Jonathan Lightman. And to remind everybody, you have three minutes to speak, and uh, Ms. Gilmer will be buzzing you when you hit 30 seconds. Okay, gentlemen. A break awaits. Let's get going. Okay, sorry. Thank you, and Chancellor Oakley, welcome, and, and President Estolano, um, Vice President Epstein. So I, I was surprised by the budget. My name's Jeffrey Michaels. I teach English at Contra Costa College. I've been a teacher for 30 years. I've been representing faculty locally for about a decade, and I just recently became president of the California Community College Independence. New to that role, I have been traveling around uh, the state and meeting with our 14 districts. I knew a lot of their leadership, and I'm struck by how different our community college districts are in our community colleges. We have large districts in Triple CI, Santa Monica and Foothill, and small districts like Redwoods, and, and the challenges and needs are very different. And I was struck because, you know, I am a big believer in guided pathways. I've led discussions over the last couple of years in my own district on 
ways of creating division clusters and aligning the schedule, and my English department is working with biology and it's working with administration of justice, and we have a lot of great plans, and I was not looking for or hoping for $150 million in one-time money to be dedicated to pathways. That's not what we need. We need more full-time faculty to share in the work, and we need part-time faculty that are committed because they're making a living wage and they're not having to teach at three different institutions. And talk about a problem we'll never be able to address with one-time money. We have to be advocating for and putting money into part-time faculty, and we need to be restoring our base to the point where we can cover the pension costs. And I was very surprised by this budget, since it seems to me we all get together as consultation council and get the collective wisdom of our system together and say, here are our priorities. And I feel a little bit like I'm I'm capable of producing a masterpiece, but they, have year after year, are handing me coloring books and saying, draw it within the lines. And not only don't you get a masterpiece that way, but I need paint. Um, I, so I just am frustrated. I appreciate the work that goes into it and could spend a lot of time thanking people. Mario could not possibly be more responsive and collaborative. But boy, if we're not the ones, the trustees, the faculty leadership, the system leadership, standing up and saying, we are the experts. We are the ones who know what these colleges need. This program after program every year where a huge amount of money is dedicated and we need a large bureaucracy to figure out how to spend the money and how to report on the money and yes, you can do this and this is the same idea, but no, unfortunately, that doesn't fit within the lines. It's very, very frustrating. So representing the faculty that I'm here to represent, I'm very frustrated by this budget and I hope we make some progress between now and May. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Leitner. Thank you. Thank you, President uh, Estelano, and Vice President Epstein, and uh, Chancellor Oakley, and members of the board, Jonathan Leitman, on behalf of the Faculty Association of California Community Colleges. Um, this morning, um, I had the privilege of attending the, uh, the Senate budget overview hearing on the budget, uh, where they covered literally every aspect of the budget. And the underlying message, which you've heard a little bit of today, is the tremendous uncertainty is what's going to happen, particularly because of changes at the federal government. What we do know is, is that there is an extreme disconnect between the Department of Finance and the LAO, where they believe the overall revenue picture is. And this may result in significant Prop 98 augmentation by the May revise. But there's also something that we know in this room. And this is something, without it being too repetitive, is this that there's a huge disconnect between what we submitted in the BCP versus what the governor has proposed. I would say that we need to get our act together as a system. Um, and I know, uh, Member Reed, you had referenced um, uh, an earlier situation in the Schwarzenegger administration. I remember that where there was some division and it resulted in some disruption. And I, I do remember a time of a number of years before that where particularly on the budget, uh, literally every organization in the community colleges seemed to have a different theme. And what happened as a result was that it worked to our disadvantage, extremely to our disadvantage. And, and over a period of time, we worked very, very hard to try to align our message to say, what exactly are our priorities? Notwithstanding whatever the governor at the time wanted to do, but to say, what is it that's needed on the ground? I, I certainly um, echo and appreciate Member Sumner's comments about our veteran students and about the need for mental health and uh, my colleague and friend Jeffrey Michaels about what is needed for the full-time and the part-time faculty, that when we reduce what we do in the community colleges to education and the process of simply teaching our students, what we recognize that the general support of the core function continues to lag, and yet we are told, well, there is additional money available for additional projects. I agree with Chancellor Oakley that the um, Guided Pathways is an opportunity to kind of string together various initiatives that already have taken place, and there's a lot of nobility to that. Uh, whether $150 million in one-time funds gets us there, I can't answer. The fact board's going to be discussing that this week. But what I can say is, is that the core functions of the community colleges are not treated appropriately in this budget, and unless we together collectively deliver that message, we're not going to take advantage of the possibility 
of increased revenue in the May revise. Time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that concludes this item. Um, I just want to say to Vice Chancellor Rodriguez, I thought your summary was excellent. Great chart, great two pager. Um, thank you for your diligent work. I know there's going to be a lot more going on before we talk again, and certainly the May revise will will have quite a few changes, I would imagine, given all thank that's you. been discussed. So. Yes, before I propose a break, yes, Member Sumner? I just had a question because, you know, why can't we, stuff that we really were passionate about that did not get approved in the budget, why can we not as a board, since there's $150 million, once we get together, say, let's put some money towards that instead of making people fight for the money, say, these are things that were our priority. Why can't we as a board possibly discuss to say, for veterans, let's as a board say, we're going to give... I mean, to ask for 20, what was it? We asked for $25,000 is nothing. Why can't we as a board, million. it's something we, but I'm, I'm just, I have to express that and get that out there. And a couple of these things that I think when there's one, 150 million somewhere, we as a board have already said what is important to us and some things didn't get approved. We just need to make a stance, so. I appreciate that. Um, so I will suggest that we take a 10 minute break looking at the watch. Let's return here at 2.15. We'll gavel it back in at 2.15. Thanks everybody.
Board Member Haynes. I got a quorum. And where's my chancellor? <laughs> Let's go. Okay, we're going to bring us back into session. And I think what we'd like to do, I think we've circulated some copies of some proposed language for the resolution back on item number, help me, Vice Chairman, we're on item number 2.3, is circulating around board members. Um, and let's have Vice Chancellor Feast and our Interim General Counsel, Jake Knapp, come forward. Maybe you can walk us through these changes. Um, see, so we have everybody here? Great. All right. Paul, do you want to take it? Okay. You need a microphone. Sorry. Right. These were the changes as we understood them in uh, three areas, four areas actually, and they're marked in track change. Okay. To the best of our recollection, they, re they reflect what um, you proposed. Okay. I should also point out that there are additional copies of this language available for the public uh, that are here uh, in attendance at the meeting uh, over on the side desk. So if you'd like to see the language and you're a member of the public, we have copies available for you as well. Board Member Haynes. Thank you. Um, I just have two very, very minor changes under the very last resolve on the first page where it says resolve that the California Community College's Board of Governors urges, and I would add the um, incoming federal, and then um, rather than government, um, change that to administration, if that. The incoming do. federal administration. And, and the, the reason in, in my thinking is that, um, um, that, the, that this is not, um, that the change that we're seeking is is not one in which the federal government at this point has, it's that's too broad, um, given that um, this is an executive order that the president solely will sort of do away with or not, as the case may be. So is that offered as a friendly amendment to the motion? Absolutely. Board member Baum? That's fine, it's consistent with the uh, paragraph above. And uh, board member Belansky is the seconder of the motion? Okay, with both of those accepting, um, I'm gonna, oh, board member Burdick? Um, on the whereas in the middle. On the whereas in the middle of the page that has been, that has all the changes there, there's actually a disconnect between the first line and the last line um, because the first part is about immigration and education policies. The last is about deportation or forced registration. I would recommend striking after fearful and call it uh, fearful um, of the results of these policies rather than limiting to those two specifics. Now, I'm going to speak on that. Um, I think we can, I think, I go back to what Board Member Haynes said in our initial discussion. There's two specific things that we've been worried about, really. We've really been, really been worried about deportations and this issue of a Muslim registry. Let's call it for what it is. Those are the two items that have been discussed, and we can code it however we want, but that's really what's making our students fearful, and our, we're hearing from our faculty and other administrators that that's what they're hearing from students. And that's where I think it's important for us to call that out, and maybe we, didn't, maybe we haven't crafted a, a great sentence, and, and as the English professor that you are, <laughs> um, <laughs> I appreciate that, but I do think capturing those two threats, the very real fear that, are, that exists on our campuses is important. Um, so I, I would, two, you want two whereases, just <laughs> Nothing like having 17 people uh, wordsmith a resolution, but that's what we get. Um, immigrants and other populations. Can somebody just, Jeff, do you think you could accept a run-on sentence just this one time? And ha <laughs> so how about <laughs> how about our fearful of the deportation or forced registration or other results of these policies? I, I, I'm concerned about that only if I okay, don't, can ahead, jump in. Only in that 
we, there may be policies that the incoming administration advocates that we're very in favor of. And, um, and so I don't want to presuppose that, um, so I, those are the things that uh, we want to be on guard against. Okay, I'm gonna give it one last chance, okay? You may be a you may be an English professor, but I'm a lawyer. Okay, <laughs> um, uh, give me this shot. Okay, where great uncertainty exists about specific immigration policies and immigrants and other populations within the community college system are fearful of policies that may result in deportation or forced registration based on their religion. I'd buy that. Excellent. All right, we're good? I'm fine. I'm looking at the seconder of the motion, who's about to accept it. Excellent, okay. Any other changes? The only, uh, sorry. <laughs> no, no, I just wanted the language uh, to, to make it consistent, whereas in that fifth paragraph we say incoming administration, and then the last one we're adding the incoming federal administration, so I would just add the word federal. The federal, I think that's Pursued that's appropriate. by the incoming federal administration, yep. and then it's reasserted in the that last okay. paragraph. President Solano, would you please read I'll that read back? I'll read the entire statement for you. Uh, of that fifth paragraph. Whereas great uncertainty exists about what specific immigration and education policies will be pursued by the incoming ad federal administration, and immigrants and other populations within the community college system are fearful of policies that may result in deportation or forced registration based on their religion. And that's the last change. Okay. I am, I hear somebody calling the question. I'm going to call for a vote. I call for a unanimous vote. All those in favor of this resolution, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Resolution's been approved. Yes. Board member Reed. Um, uh, if, if I'm wrong, and, and the administration does proceed in going forward, as Ms. Haynes and, and uh, Ms. Shaw feel they may. I think it behooves us as a board to give uh, a consensus or direction to you and to our chancellor to uh, take appropriate action on behalf of the board's interests. And because of the fact that we meet so infrequently, uh, to convene this board would be a difficult task. And, and uh, I don't want to limit your uh, scope, but simply to give direction and ask my colleagues to join me in in that effort. I, I appreciate that. Um, I think what we'd like to do, I've talked about this with the chancellor, we'd like to set up essentially a rapid response task force to do just that. Um, things move quickly now these days, and so we'd, we would propose having a couple of members of the board and governors, and I'd like to actually ask Board Member Khan to join me in that rapid response group being convened by the chancellor, um, that if anything happens, we can quickly uh, move together with a small group of people representing different constituencies of, I hear you, Jake, it's okay, of the, um, of, of the community college community um, to quickly respond and advise the chancellor on responding. Um, chancellor Oakley. Yeah, thank you, uh, Board President Delano. Um, um, I think uh, in keeping with the spirit of that request, um, we have had some internal discussions about this issue. One, I want to assure the board that we are working now on plan B, C, D, and E, should things happen, uh, and working in close partnership with our sister um, systems as well. Uh, but should, should uh, things begin to happen, uh, it'd be great to be able to pull together a working group of individuals um, uh, that uh, from the board that uh, Board President Stolano would appoint. Um, I would like to have uh, uh, Deputy Chancellor Skinner uh, uh, convene the group um, uh, should it be necessary. Uh, and uh, we'll certainly reach out to some of the more um, directly involved constituent leaders to help us think this through as well. So. Um, I think it would be uh, easier if it was done through the office of the chancellor, um, and then we'd pull together the appropriate expertise to help us deal with whatever issue comes up. Interim General Counsel Knapp. 
No, that's perfect. I just wanted to, uh, I was actually to make the same point that Chancellor Oakley just made, which is uh, that, the, that the, the Rapid Response Task Force has uh, already been put in motion and convened by the chancellor, chancellor himself and the chancellor's office. That's exactly right. And we'll have two board, my, so myself and uh, board member Connor, happy to be available to consult. Yes, board member Baum. My request would be also that uh, obviously I think we will work closely with our new attorney general and that perhaps we even invite the attorney general to, uh, to speak at a future board meeting to talk about how California is um, pursuing uh, and upholding the policies and values that uh, we uh, have adopted here. Thank you for that suggestion. Yes, board member Shaw. Yeah, um, I would, you know, I'm pleased to hear about um, plans for BC and D&E and everything else, but um, I just wanted to emphasize that the fear is real now. Yes. And even if, if the new administration comes in and they don't do anything for six months, people are still very, very afraid. And so we need to have some sort, I don't know if we want to have some sort of review on best practices to deal with uh, special counselors or I don't know what we could do, but I think we need to do something in the interim. I don't know what that would be. Uh, board member Shaw, I mean, we certainly he hear you and, and um, I, I agree with you and we will continue to work with um, the college constituency groups uh, and share every piece of information that we have in terms of how the local colleges can and should respond. Mm -hmm. Um, we will also continue to reassure student groups. Um, we will continue to work with the University of California and Cal State University system uh, to um, understand um, things that they are providing their students. Um, and many of you read the University of California is providing some legal support. Mm -hmm. um, we will look uh, and work with our local boards to make sure that they're connected to um, social justice organizations, pro bono services, things of that nature, to make sure that if services are required, that they can be accessed as soon as possible. Thank you. Okay, I think board member Haynes also wanted to make a comment. I just wanted to reassure my colleagues on this board that um, throughout the state, our colleges, many of them are stepping up and have yeah. stepped up um, over the last um, few months relative to um, the election and are working um, on the ground and in the field to make certain that um, our students are feeling safe, that they have places to go, that there's counseling available, that their legal, legal services are made available, um, and that, that this is not just, there was, this is not had, this has not been just the responsibility of our counselors, but our faculty as well has stepped up to provide volunteer services to make certain that um, we are staying, um, trying to stay on top of assuring our, our students that they are in a safe place. Thank you. All right, with that, no further discussion. Let's move on to item 3.2. Okay. Vice Chancellor Mattoon, welcome to the dais. It's great to see you. Welcome on board. Good afternoon, uh, President Estelano, Vice President Epstein, members of the Board of Governors, and Chancellor Oakley. Today, Mike McGee and I will present informational item 3.2 regarding state and federal legislative updates. In your materials at the dais, you have three documents, a legislative matrix, as well as a federal and state summary document. I'm not gonna cover all the items in those documents. And similar to uh, Vice Chancellor Rodriguez, I held back those items from being included in what was sent out so that they could be as up to date as possible. Um, in regards to the state legislature, we're still very early in the legislative session. The Senate and Assembly reconvened on December 5th, and members have until February 17th to introduce new bills. To date, about 300 bills have been introduced, and of those, about 35 are related to higher education. Introduced bills will be amended and refined in the coming months. Uh, we also anticipate about 100 to 200 higher education related bills will be introduced during the legislative session. I just wanted to highlight two areas that I think are of particular interest to the legislature and to this body. First is um, the area of protecting California's undocumented population. There's been a number of bills introduced so far that focus on this issue. Specific to higher education, AB 21 by newly elected Assemblymember Ash Kalra 
aims to ensure that higher education institutions are safe spaces for undocumented students. The bill contains several provisions, including prohibiting higher education institutions from sharing information regarding the immigration status of a student. It would require campuses to offer on-campus housing or a stipend for housing uh, during periods in between academic terms for students who would face a risk of deportation. And it would also require colleges uh, to provide access to legal services for students who might need such services in order to continue their education. Assembly and Senate leadership have also announced a package of bills aimed at protecting California's larger undocumented population. I'm just gonna mention a couple of these. SB 54 would prohibit law enforcement, including community college police, from using resources to investigate, detain, or arrest persons for immigration-related purposes. And SB 6 would create a state grant program to fund nonprofit legal aid organizations to provide services to those facing deportation. Finally, in this category, I wanna mention legislation by Senator Lara, which would extend the AB 540 exemption from non-resident tuition to students who complete a community college transfer pathway. This bill, SB 68, attempts to address the needs of California's non-traditional undocumented student population. Those students who wouldn't qualify for the non-resident tuition exemption under the requirements under AB 540 relating to high school attendance and graduation. The other area of legislative interest that I wanted to mention today is around college affordability and financial aid. There's a number of bills on this topic included in your matrix. I'm just gonna highlight two that are specific to our California community college students. AB 19 by Assemblymember Santiago is a reintroduction of legislation he authored last year. It would make students with as little as $1 of financial need eligible for a Board of Governors fee waiver. Currently the need threshold is $1,104 and we estimate that that change would affect about 30,000 students. Second, Senator Leva has reintroduced um, legislation from last year, SB 15, which would increase the amount of the Cal Grant C stipend for students enrolled in CTE programs from currently it's $547 and it would be increased to $3,000. Our office has been working really closely with Senator Leva's office on how we can increase overall usage in the Cal Grant C program among our community college students. And her office has been really open to these ongoing conversations and potential amendments as the bill moves forward. I did wanna note that this administration has consistently increased financial aid only through the budget and not in legislation. And I also wanna mention that last year, in our current year's budget act, the legislature required the LAO to research and report back on the possibility of combining all of California's existing financial aid programs into a single entitlement program that could ensure all low and middle income students could graduate from college debt free. The report is expected to be released at the end of this month. Just a couple of final notes on the state legislative side. Uh, Assemblymember Jose Medina was reappointed as chair of the Assembly Higher Education Committee and Assemblymember Kevin McCarty was reappointed as chair of the Assembly Subcommittee on Education and Finance. In the Senate, Senator Ben Allen was appointed to chair the Senate Committee on Education. He replaces Senator Carol Liu, who left the Senate due to term limits. Um, he was previously a member of that committee. And the newly elected Senator Anthony Portantino was appointed as chair of the Senate subcommittee, Budget Subcommittee on um, Education Finance. He was previously an assembly member who chaired the Assembly Higher Education Committee. At this point, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Mike McGee, who is going to provide a federal update. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chancellor Mattoon, members of the board. I'll just go over a little bit of information because as you know, changes at the federal level are constant and moving targets. So to provide up-to-date information is a little bit difficult. In fact, uh, as an example right now, uh, Betsy DeVos, who is uh, named by President-elect to be head of the Department of Education, is going through her hearing as we speak. Um, in her prepared comments that were um, sent out through the press, she did make a very brief comment relating to community colleges about in reference to supporting all post-secondary avenues, including trade voca and vocational schools and community colleges. Um, the hearing, obviously, uh, as it goes on, uh, may reveal more about higher education interests, uh, but right now we mostly know about her K through 12 interests. Uh, just last week, the members of the Senate Help Committee uh, were named, and that's in your document. 
Um, but you'll notice that uh, there is not a member of the California delegation that represented there. But in our report, we stated that the uh, House Education and Workforce Committee membership was not named. Subsequent to you know, following um, the printing of our federal report, uh, they did announce members of the, the House Committee. Uh, Virginia Fox, um, as, as stated in the report, remains the chair. Uh, Congressman Duncan Hunter on the Republican side is the only member of the California delegation. And on the de Democratic side, we have uh, Representative Susan Davis, uh, Mark Takano, who was a trustee at uh, Community College District, and Representative Mark DeSaulnier in, um, on the, the committee who represent California. Um, with respect to legislation, it's new as uh, the state is, um, but uh, just to point out a couple things, as was the case at the end of the 114th Congress, uh, a couple of bills have been introduced uh, referencing DACA, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, uh, most notably uh, the bipartisan bill by Durbin and Lindsey Graham, um, which they're calling the Bar Removal of Individuals Who Dream and Grow Our Economy Act, or the Bridge Act. Um, it's language is not yet available, but it's supposed to provide provisional protected status to DACA recipients and allow undocumented immigrants who are DACA eligible to, to apply for temporary protected status. There's a few other measures that are in their basically infancy, uh, mostly been announced, and they relate to Pell Grants, higher education, health care, prohibiting a, natural, a national registry, as well as veterans. Um, it's very new with some of these measures. They were just introduced, uh, a few of them last week, uh, so language is unavailable. And that uh, concludes the federal report. We're happy to answer any questions. Do we have any public comment? No? No? Okay. Okay, please. Um, and whatnot, and I'm wondering, um, not to beat a dead horse, but you know, with, with the new administration, uh, should we return, maybe uh, find some resource maybe to try to return to that uh, so we can monitor these issues a little more closely than we, we might otherwise? Chancellor Oakley. <laughs> That's a great question, Board Member Reed. Um, we are, um, it is a priority of, of the Office of the Chancellor that we seek uh, greater resources in Washington, D.C. We are the largest system of higher education in the country, and we have n no physical presence in Washington, D.C. And I think uh, with the new administration coming in, it is uh, more important than ever that we have a voice at the table that represents the interests of this board and, and my office. So we will be working to see how we can uh, have a presence in Washington, D.C., and we will come back to you later uh, once we uh, finalize some recommendations and some thoughts on how we can best do that. Chancellor Oakley, you know, there are a lot of nodding heads, and I, I personally would strongly endorse you uh, moving forward on that. I think now more than ever we really need to have a presence in Washington appropriate to the size of our system and the importance that it plays for the U.S. economy. So I, I don't see any objections to that. I think you're going to have a lot of support from the Board of Governors for moving forward on that. Board Member Baum. I just had a question, too. With, with the transition of the Department of Education, most of the people with whom we've worked closely are obviously transitioning. With whom do we actually dialogue with when it comes to important policy initiatives? And then second, for Chancellor Oakley, I, I just noticed, too, Tina Powell, who's been appointed, uh, you have a long relationship with her because she was spearheaded the 10,000 Small Businesses Initiative. And is that a, a, and how do you anticipate maybe engaging with her as a senior administration official? But uh, those are the two questions I have. I'll work backwards and then turn it over, hand it off to Laura. Um, I mean, um, obviously, we are paying close attention to that uh, the president-elect makes. Uh, particular interest will be the undersecretary of higher education. Let's see who the secretary is first. But uh, those are issues that we are paying particular attention to. And as you can expect, we are reaching out to anyone and everyone who has any opportunity to influence the discussion uh, at Trump Tower or anywhere else. Um, 
our uh, fortunate uh, Dina Powell um, from Goldman Sachs has spearheaded the 10,000 Small Businesses Program. Um, I have many years of experience working with her. She understands the importance of community colleges, so we do have a voice. Whether or not that voice is given the opportunity to speak on behalf of higher education, we'll see. But we're, we're going to try and find every voice that we can. Um, there have been some promising signs in the transition that there is an openness to discuss the importance of community colleges. And most importantly, um, the congressional leadership is someone uh, or, or, um, someone that we will be reaching out early and often to um, because the policy expertise now lies in, in those two houses, uh, whereas uh, the Obama administration had developed a lot of policy expertise. They were involved in a lot of policy discussions. We got to know those members. In the near term, it will be very important to, uh, to communicate with the staff. Other questions? I, I would ask uh, the Chancellor and, and maybe uh, Vice Chancellor Mattoon to comment. We're doing a little bit of planning already on our congressional visits for the annual conference of AACT. I never get it quite right. Um, I know that uh, myself, uh, Vice President Epstein, um, Board Member Baum will be there, as well as Board Member Haynes, and I think we are planning to try to hit the, hit the hill pretty hard, as well as uh, board member uh, Debbie Malumet has offered to make herself available if it's of, of use to her, and, and she certainly has been important and helpful for us in, in past visits. Uh, Chancellor or Vice Chancellor, do you want to make any comments about that? I, since uh, our Vice Chancellor is uh, organizing the trip, I will uh, uh, let her talk about the, the very exciting schedule we're trying to put together for you. <laughs> We've put in requests to congressional leadership as well as members of our California delegation. We're still in the process of getting those scheduled. Um, we're also working with AACC and ACCT to identify those um, potential leaders within the incoming um, administration that will be leaders in the Department of Education to try and get staff level meetings. We're also working with our um, partners who have on the ground operations in DC, like the Institute for College Access and Success, to um, identify um, congressional staffers that may help at the staff level for us to improve our coordination and communication with DC. Um, and then we will have a draft agenda for the members that are attending the delegation closer to the end of this month, as well as um, background pamphlets for us to hand out during our visits. All right, thank you. If there are any further questions or comments, thank you very much for your presentation. Okay, we're going to move on to item 3.3, the update on pathways. Vice Chancellor Tenna, I think you may have some other guests you're inviting up. Okay. As Vice Chancellor Tenna fires up uh, the presentation, um, I just want to make a couple of quick comments uh, about this agenda item. This is uh, an exciting opportunity for our colleges. Um, there's a lot of great work always happening across the nation, and sometimes there's great work that starts to converge across the nation, and this is one of those times when um, colleges throughout the country, and even in our state, as was mentioned before, a lot of work is being done to, re to reimagine the way that um, we work with our students and, and to redesign our colleges, particularly the front door of our colleges, how we reach out to support, welcome students, how we work with them from beginning to end, and how we do a better job of creating pathways for them that are clear, coherent, um, relative to their educational goals, and gets them to their educational goals as quickly as possible, always recognizing that um, the um, academic quality of the programs they participate in is at the highest level. Um, so uh, this is exciting because it really brings together all of the investments that have been made in our colleges. And yes, I agree with uh, our colleagues who have made comments that a lot of these are one-time funds and we need ongoing funds. But in the, in the near term, it allows us the opportunity to bring all the stakeholders together at our college campuses and talk about and put into practice transformational change which is what this is about, 
transformational change that puts the students at the center of this whole discussion. So I'm excited about the possibilities uh, that uh, this initiative presents for the system. It is not a new initiative. It is a way of thinking at the lowest level on each and every one of our colleges. It's a framework. It's not a program. It's not an initiative. It's a framework on how we bring everybody together and focus on data and ensure that we are doing everything we can to get our students to their educational goal as quickly as possible. So with that introduction, I will turn it over to Vice Chancellor Tena. Thank you very much. Uh, Board President Estolano, Vice President Epstein, Chancellor Oakley, board members. Um, this is a pathways introduction. I know that we've had a couple of discussions about this particular item in the budget. And of course, uh, our chancellor has provided some overview and context. Um, in addition, I have with me today a trailblazer in this area, uh, Sonia Christian, who's the president of Bakersfield College. And we're going to uh, start off with a little bit of um, background and overview of concepts. We're going to talk a little bit about the uh, national and particularly state efforts that are going on within California. And then we're also going to touch upon uh, what is going on in California specifically with the California Guided Pathways. And I want to uh, at least provide a little bit of context for this. And as Chancellor Oakley mentioned, and uh, I know Vice Chancellor Rodriguez also discussed, you know, this is something that is looking to bring together a, a number of initiatives that have been set in motion within our California community colleges over the last few years. Um, there has been quite a bit of national focus, uh, a book that was re released in 2014, uh, this Redesigning America's Community College, certainly outlines a framework for this effort. And uh, we're going to step through some of the uh, concepts at a, at a very high level. Now, in terms of uh, pathways model, uh, this I'm not going to read every single one of these bullets. Um, you know, you, you certainly have the presentation before you, as well within your agenda packets. You have a outline of some of the activities that are going on within California, and uh, in addition, you also have a paper that was authored uh, by Dr. Uh, Sonia Christian and a uh, faculty member at Bakersfield College, and additional information on the California Guided Pathways Project. But, you know, this is, again, bringing together a number of concepts and processes and practices. Uh, this is looking at, you know, redesigning that student experience. Um, there's a tremendous focus in the book in terms of providing more of a um, different model rather than this cafeteria model, uh, you know, very much a focused pathway process for our students, looking at um, learning outcomes by programs and not courses. And um, again, trying to provide as uh, efficient and uh, clear path for students as they're progressing through their programs. Very much uh, this activity focuses on the end goal in mind, be it certificate or degree and uh, is very dependent upon working with local high schools uh, to provide you know, clearer direction for students and clearer uh, pathways as they transition from high school to community colleges. And again, uh, very much relies upon uh, interactions and co collaboration with our four-year institutions and particularly uh, employers as well. And I think as um, Chancellor Oakley mentioned, this is a framework that focuses on, you know, certainly transfer, but very much focuses on a lot of the uh, work that's been set in motion on the workforce side. And I think one aspect to particularly underscore and recognize is that, you know, this is not a approach that can be uh, completed in, you know, one year, two years, it very clearly lays out in the book and in the processes that are being set forth that it will take time, time for planning, time for implementation, uh, time to adjust in terms of implementation, and it will similarly take time for us to determine the outcomes and the metrics. Um, I mean, measuring impact will take time as well. Um, but I think, you know, out the gate, I think this is one of those areas where it's been very upfront in terms of the process that needs to occur 
in order for the outcomes that are desired uh, to be realized. Very key to this success of this particular um, approach is the in involvement of faculty and advisors in terms of uh, determining these pathways, guiding, monitoring, and supporting the students. Um, I think it bears tremendous underscoring that uh, you know, this work uh, is critical uh, to happen and the faculty involvement is absolutely critical for its success. In terms of uh, just providing a little bit of, uh, you know, national context, um, you know, there's some materials in the write-up, but I think, you know, again, this is something that has been undertaken, uh, you know, nationally. AACC has a guided pathways project that is unfolding right now. Um, you know, there are a number of institutions that we can look to nationally uh, for examples and approaches. Um, prominent among those are Sinclair Community College District um, and also St. Petersburg Community College District in Florida. Um, just, I think the, the thing that is particularly underscored in those approaches is, um, you know, they've restructured their programs to create uh, career and academic um, communities as well um, very much prepared information accessible on their websites and also um, materials for their students that identify very clear pathways to achieve their particular educational outcome desired. And as you can uh, look through in the agenda packet, um, you know, we highlight a number of initiatives that are set in motion within California that very much complement uh, the environment for this particular initiative to occur. You know, this is a initiative that is, um, you know, very broad in its approach, in its framework. Um, and again, um, initiatives within California, such as SB 1440, um, which established the associate degree for transfer. Um, you know, we have the student success scorecard, which already identifies uh, metrics and outcomes at a system level. There are um, programs that have been set in place, particularly Santa Barbara's Get Focus and Stay Focus, a dual enrollment program that actually provides about a 10-year planning horizon for uh, the concurrent dual enrollment programs that go on in that uh, region of the state, um, as well the Common Assessment Initiatives Multiple Measures Assessment Project, um, the California Acceleration Project. Um, there's also technology tools uh, which are now in place or in, in the process of being uh, deployed within the state through the education planning initiative. Uh, one particular tool, Starfish, is, is assist students in terms of their tracking and planning uh, their programs to ensure that they are on track. There's similarly uh, a number of initiatives through the RP group that have been set in motion. Um, one in particular, the student support redefined effort. Um, there's a number of, again, colleges that are already embarked. We've talked about Santa Barbara. There's Norco College that's already engaged in this work. A number of our community colleges are engaged in strands of this work. And then, of course, um, the work that's been uh, set in motion through the California Career Pathways Trust. Um, you know, again, this is a effort that primarily uh, has been uh, in motion for the last few years, very focused on the uh, workforce side, but the themes of uh, of uh, you know, the early college planning, the cultivation of soft skills, work-based learning are all components uh, that certainly uh, can be integrated into this uh, California, uh, this pathways approach. Um, so with, with that, just providing a, a bit of an overview of concepts, some of the national and state uh, activities that uh, provide a uh, process and already a example of some of the approaches that California is engaged in that could complement this. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Sonia to talk more uh, specifically in terms of the Bakersfield College and the California Guided Pathways. Well, let me start, start by saying that I'm really, really delighted to be here and uh, listening to your deliberations and, oh, uh, Chair President Estelano. Vice President Epstein and Chancellor Oakley. Um, your deliberations about uh, issues related to students, the equity focus, and at the same time zooming up to what we need to do in Washington, D.C. 
to make sure that the largest system of higher education is not only protected, but is recognized and, and has a level of influence nationally and not just at the state level. So I'm going to take back to Bakersfield College and my colleagues as other presidents to let them know that the California Community Colleges are, is in very good hands with your leadership. So let me start by saying thank you very much. So um, guided pathways. So I started as president at BC about four years ago. I've been a faculty member, I was a math faculty member. And um, I was fortunate that at that time, we had money coming to the college for various student success programs, and thank you very much. Teresa mentioned that you invested in learning about multiple measures. You invested in matriculation. You invested in figuring out the transfer degrees, the ADTs to CSU. And as a recipient, as one of your 113 community colleges, we could see the change happening. But the change was happening within departments and the campus as a whole was still siloed. So about two years ago, just about when the book by uh, Bailey, Jenkins, and Jaggers from the Community College Research Center in Columbia came out, Redesigning America's Community Colleges, a few of the senior faculty at Bakersfield College and administration and students, actually, we started reading the book and discussing the book. And at the same time, we started looking at some data snippets. And we realized that the average number of credits a student at BC completed to transfer was 85, right? And typically, and we're not saying 60 is kind of, it has to be 60, you, you need to you know, ensure that learning happens. But 85 credits, and now you start talking about the equity agenda, right? You're talking about Kern County, where our poverty level is high, it's about 25%. Our baccalaureate completion level is one of the lowest in the state. It's at 15%. And so there was a, the conversation quickly shifted to, you know what? We're not doing enough. We have an obligation to these first generation students. Over 80% of our students are first generation. I was really happy to hear the emphasis on our veterans. These students need to get connected and they need to move quickly while they are learning. And the idea that the, the college as an organization needed to go through our own learning to understand how we could integrate all of what we were doing. And Chancellor Oakley talked about it is an integration. It's not something new. It wasn't a new project that we adopted. But there came a point when we recognized we had resources. And well, it's not sufficient. We need more. But with the resources we had, were we being really smart about not you know, having the burden of initiative fatigue, but really integrating as a whole college community coming together? So what is Guided Pathways? Simply put, it is an institution establishing a sense of relentless clarity. Can I say with confidence? that at Bakersfield College, before a student arrives in their senior year at high school, that they have clarity about their choices, what their end goal is, even if they want to shift their end goal and be able to navigate the crazy maps of majors, and I can tell you no. Because clarity has components to it. Clarity means we need to have curricular alignment. That means our faculty working with our CSU counterparts and our community and our high school counterparts need to establish those pathways. And then the second part is making them visible. Because if we have those pathways and we keep it a secret, they don't know it. It's almost like the story I told at the IEPI workshop that Teresa organized and was completely sold out is I come from a little town in the southern part of India. And you know, for a foreigner to come to the southern part of India and navigate the streets, it's crazy. You've got to ask this person in a tea shop for directions. 
So the concept of pathways is using our current technologies, and the technology is both it is tech, high tech, and high touch for our first generation students to make the pathways pop. It's not about restricting or limiting them to a single pathway, but it is about bringing the clarity so that if they want to shift, they know how to shift, and we owe it to them more than we owe it to those students who for generations had grandparents who were doctors and lawyers. We owe it to these students because they're not having these conversations in their home. So the first point is relentless clarity and simultaneously, so that's the pathways. And the guided part of the guided pathways to me is absolutely important to indicate that these students need that guidance, almost like a coach. When our, when our basketball coach, Paula Dahl, tells our students, who are winning all the championships, by the way, you know, I need you to come in and practice for three hours. Do the students start getting into a quarrel with her? No. That's my coach. My coach is my ally. My coach wants me to perform at the highest level. But we don't do that with our first generation students, right? We don't coach them. So that guidance comes from almost like a tough love concept. And again, I won't mention the integration because Chancellor Oakley did a remarkable job talking about reimagining and integrating and building on what we have. But I do want to spend a little bit of time, maybe a minute, to talk about organizational learning. So what happened at Bakersfield College and at other colleges in the state of California is really having discussions with faculty who are in disciplines, like the chemist and the counselor, sitting down with the ed advisor and their educational administrator, their dean, to have these discussions about taking students through the entire pathway to completion. So now the responsibility is not just at a course level, but at the entire program level. My job as a president now changes. How do I conduct my college council meetings? Where am I spending my time? So organizational learning is in some ways relearning my job as president. It is relearning what our deans are doing so that we're not adding on to the weight of work and now we're working 80 hours a week instead of working 70 hours a week. No, no, no. It's about staying healthy by taking the time of reimagining and putting that into practice. And so along with a culture shift, we've got to be thinking of policy and system shifts as well. And I'll say a quick comment about one-time funding. I'm not a proponent of one-time funding. I like base funding. However, at Bakersfield College, we have received several grants, and we went after grants as a strategy to be able to release faculty to get together and rethink what we're doing. So we use that one-time funding, whether it's a 2.5 million, our, our budget is 90 million, but that 2.5 was about rethinking what we're doing with the 90 million. So there is value in it, but I wouldn't say that out in public because we do need our base funding to increase as well. So to start wrapping up, um, the way we've been talking about guided pathways, again, Chancellor Oakley and uh, Vice Chancellor Tenna have been talking about a framework. It doesn't tell a college that you have to do this. It doesn't say that to keep a student to be successful in their English class and in their program, they have to have a co-requisite or they have to do their supplemental instruction. It doesn't say, it doesn't prescribe. But what it says is that it demands us to clarify the path. It demands us to come together as a college and think about how students enter the path because if they don't enter well and we don't give them that attention, they could start off in a wrong place that costs taxpayer dollars and it costs the students tuition and books. So starting them on the right path is a whole college business. 
It's not the business of the outreach department. It is our music faculty partnering with outreach and going out there into the high schools and telling their students about the different majors that they can engage in. So they're starting to think, okay, what do I like? What are my interests? What are my skill sets? They're starting to have a purpose and not come in and just take a bunch of classes. It doesn't mean that it doesn't allow them to explore. They can explore if they want to, but they have the clarity. Entering the path and then staying on the path, keeping students on the path like Coach Paula Dahl, coaching them, creating completion coaching communities, and never, ever, ever compromise on learning. So this is learning whether, you know, love the work of strong workforce, um, amazing, amazing work. I mean, concepts like internships make the learning meaningful and gets our students connected with industry. So that ensuring meaningful learning is a key aspect, but really the Pathways Framework says, let's look at it from a programmatic standpoint and not just chunks of classes. So in conclusion, Teresa wanted me to just give you a sense of the California Guided Pathways Project, and I'm just gonna show you a picture because when you look at the picture, you're going to say, see people, leaders in our community, who have been working with you on the different aspects of, um, ca uh, of California students' success. So you can see uh, Teresa Tena is there. You can see our Academic Senate President and some of her team members. Uh, you can see Campaign for College Opportunity. Oh, we don't have the Student Success Center. Paul uh, Steenhausen was part of it, and we have the, our new director of the Student Success Center, which is going to be critical for this piece. You've got our CSU uh, counterparts. You've got our trustees. Who am I missing? You've got, oh, you've got Tom Bailey, the guy sitting on the front row, row second from the left is Tom Bailey. He's one of the writers of Redesigning, and Davis Jenkins was not here. And then you've got some of our uh, foundation, like Sean Whalen, who is from our College Future. So this particular group of individuals, and if I missed anyone, I'm, I'm sorry about that, but in terms of this, this project, um, a few of us got together and all of us started talking and we asked for one-time funding from College Futures and some other um, foundations like Teagle. And we are funding 15 to 20 community colleges for four years, three years, to go through six institutes. So the concept of organizational learning and those, that institute model I think is really important because sometimes we demand accountability through reports and there is value in that to some extent, but demanding accountability by creating the conditions of success and creating the conditions of success, I think, is the institute model. We create the condition for success for our student in our English 1A class by demanding that student in their weekly planner to go and write and write and write and practice their writing in the writing center, right? We demand that. So for organizations, we need to take time and go through that organizational learning in collaboration and in community. And one of the key pieces of the, uh, the Guided Pathways, which is a framework, it emphasizes collaboration and integration, but it emphasizes that reimagining and the relearning that happens when we take time for that organizational learning to happen. So with that, I turn it back to Teresa. I just wanted to give a little bit of um, context. Uh, you know, when I, we mentioned AACC uh, previously, you know, they are, they've initiated a nationwide project, um, and three California community colleges are participating in that right now, uh, Bakersfield, Mount Sac, and Irvine Valley. Um, I think, um, you know, what this, this California Guided Pathways uh, project underscores is just over the last few years, uh, the deliberate way that the system has begun initiatives um, you know, certainly there's been, you know, seed money provided um, for this California Guided Pathways project. There's been initiatives that the state has supported, like Institutional Effectiveness Partnership Initiative, which really focuses on providing technical assistance and professional development. And, you know, again, by having all of these constituent groups represented, and, you know, this was an effort that began before anyone knew there were going to be any dollars provided through the state uh, budget process that was proposed last week. But the planning has begun, and you know, the efforts of 
trying to determine you know, what the size, 15 to 20 uh, potential colleges um, was already in motion. And so you know, that's positioned the system well. Um, it certainly laid the groundwork in terms of being successful uh, because you know, as evidenced by the administration's proposal, they're really interested in scaling this up. And so to the extent that we're prepared to do that and these processes that have been set in place are trying to lay the groundwork for that, um, will allow us to be more uh, likely in meeting the, ed the educational outcomes of our students and the overall goals of the state of California. Okay, we have one speaker and then we'll turn to board comments. Um, um, Julie Bruno. Thank you for the presentation, by the way, it was terrific. President Estolano. Vice President Epstein, Chancellor Oakley, board members, um, the pathway models, including California Guided Pathways, holds tremendous promise for our system and our students. The appeal of the effort resides in the integrated and intentional uh, approach and the holistic focus on student experience and in the flexibility to adapt to all 106, 116, wow, I just increased our number of colleges, 113 very unique colleges across the state of California. Um, of course, any Pathways framework must be a collaborative effort that engages all stakeholder groups on campus, but it's imperative that we recognize that much of the Pathways work falls within the purview of the Academic Senate and academic and professional matters. And as such, Academic Senates must be in the lead and faculty must remain involved in all stages of planning and implementation, and that's our counseling and our program faculty, of course. At our fall plenary session, um, our delegates passed a resolution directing the Senate to investigate and disseminate um, effective practices for Pathways programs, which we will be doing as uh, more Pathway programs are designed and implemented. implemented excuse me. Uh, the Academic Senate is very committed to supporting faculty as they engage in this really important work at our colleges. So we really look forward to see what, what the future holds as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have uh, Board Member Reed. Thank you for your presentation. Um, uh, the question, Doctor, um, in my local high school, they've had a very successful uh, Pathways program, but it seems to be really focused on community involvement, such as my doctor, my dentist, my optometrist. These people are all part of the Pathway program and meet regularly with the faculty and the administration and so forth. I, I heard you mention internships in your presentation, but I didn't see a focus on, on community involvement from professionals that lead this pathway. And I'm just curious, on the, in the community college level, is it, is it much a focus on the local business community as it is the high school, or is it a different kind of a pathway? So um, the, the specific pathway that you're talking about, about is phenomenal, and it's at Porterville College and the high school. And Dr. Rosa Carlson is part of the current community college district. And that particular one is similar to uh, the CCPT Trust. It's, it's called linked learning, I think, and someone, right? So it starts at the high school, and it's really focused on getting students connected with business and industry. And the Guided Pathways umbrella really encompasses uh, all types of pathways. So that particular one, I would say, is an incredible Guided Pathways model because it provides the clarity, it provides the connections for those students, and the whole community takes ownership. And what is also phenomenal about the program you're referring to, it has got some features of the College Promise idea. So the, the community starts committing to looking at financial barriers for students, and if there are any financial barriers, then they try to mitigate it uh, through community philanthropic efforts. Um, so it's to me, it's an example of a great guided pathways approach. If I can quickly add, uh, Board Member Reed, um, in some ways, um, we're catching up with the career technical side of the house um, across the entire college. Uh, career pathways have been ongoing for a number of years now, as you've been experiencing. Uh, so really, this is about laying out um, the framework for all the pathways that students are confronted with uh, to have that kind of same clarity and to continue to blur the lines between high school and community college. All right, I have board members Belansky followed by 
Haynes, and then Board Member Delili. Thank you for the presentation, and thank you for the workshop that you did at the beginning of December, I think it was, yes. Um, <clears throat> I would hope that as we move forward, because there's all these initiatives that can be out there, that there is some way of trying to find a way to link them, because even we were doing that, but, you know, that the triple SP, equity, basic skills, other initiatives, like how they can work with the guided pathways, uh, so that it's not separate movements, right. but it's linked somehow. I think that will be very important. And I do think that uh, we do need to talk a lot about services for students that are beyond the classroom and the value of those services and how to get students um, knowledgeable about them. Uh, in fact, one of the reports that we received uh, as an update to the Board of Governors uh, that came like from Cal State Sacramento said that, you know, maybe there are certain kinds of services that need to be mandatory because we don't necessarily have orientation, as an example, is mandatory at the moment or other things. We need to do more of that to cause students, like the Santa Barbara thing says, get focused instead of like, well, I don't know what to do next. And, and a lot of students have that because they're, they didn't learn that in high school. Community college is different. It even said there probably should be some kind of orientation for students that leave community college and go to a four-year school to know how do you navigate that and stay on track. Um, I wanted to give a little bit of um, response in terms of that first part of your comment. And uh, I think there's a certain amount of initiative fatigue that is going on throughout the system. I mean, certainly these are um, needed resources on a variety of programmatic areas. But I think one of the things that we're finding within the um, IEPI um, areas of focus, the, le the letters that come back from the um, colleges requesting assistance is in integrated planning. And it's to deal exactly with what you're talking about, is connecting all of the initiatives in a coordinated way to avoid duplication of effort. And you know that is actually um, you know very much at the foundation of of this type of an approach. And you know even year one, it speaks to that just the Im immense amount of planning that needs to occur, so that you can have all of these initiatives um, connected, braided, um, so that you know you ultimately have these outcomes that you're trying to achieve, and you have then identified the resources to be able to do that. If I could just add one more thing, um, the ultimate goal here is so that is that we don't have discussions about one demographic group of students versus another versus another. We don't need an initiative for every group of students. We need an opportunity to ensure that local colleges are looking at their student body and determining what is the best approach for their students veterans, students of color, first generation students, rural white students, whatever the case may be. My hope is that over time, we can start focusing on local outcomes for students and less about which program we need to fight to fund. Um, we are fighting for students, for every student on every campus in 113 communities. Um, that's going to take time. That's a big picture. That is... Uh, a goal that will take changes on the local college campus culture. It'll take a lot of work to change the culture of the California community college system and the way we fund our system. But that is the ultimate goal, is that uh, we, we look at colleges and look at their central planning document, whether that's their educational master plan, strategic plan, and each and every one of these groups of students that we articulate during the course of our meetings are are identified in that plan and that the funding that we're giving them allows them to do the best work necessary at the local level to help them succeed. That is the ultimate goal of a guided pathways model is to bring it down to the lowest level and give them the guidance, support, uh, and ultimately the responsibility and accountability to serve every student in that community.
Thank you. I have board member Haynes and then board member Jalili. Thank you very much. Um, so f first I'd like to um, just note what a wonderful article you and Dr. Um, Strobel present it. Um, I am in the process of completing my reading, reading of Redesigning America's Community Colleges. Our chancellor um, was generous enough to ensure that about 250 copies went out to faculty, the first come, first serve. Um, it was First, it was only 150, and there was such a demand by faculty and staff that he had to sort of up that, that ante. So there is at least 300 or so copies of that. But your article was so clear and so concise in nine pages. I'm hoping that we can share this beyond our members because it's just very helpful. We had a convocation on Friday and Chancellor King sort of asked folks, mostly faculty and staff in, in the audience, did they know sort of um, what path they, pathways were and he sort of asked them to raise their hand. Um, and so there is work to be done in terms of faculty understanding what the implications are. And I would say at this point that faculty is at the heart and as the, at the center and is key to the success of Pathways um, because they are expert in their fields and really sort of know how to break down those silos. The other observation I'd like to make is um, the reference to websites and how important they are to our students in trying to navigate what is available to them. And then the, and the idea of combining sort of um, what, what did you call the mega majors where it's not just going potentially after one job, but maybe a suite of potential jobs um, that students may not even know or be aware of, and to include what the range of sal salaries might be. Um, so for a student who is going, and this is one that many students already know, that's going in the health, uh, allied health field, um, to know that an LVN, the, the, the range of salary is here, but for an RN, mm -hmm. the range of salary is here. And so um, this is invaluable information for our students, and it's not linked. I can't tell you the number of calls I've gotten from parents and others who they're trying to figure out and help their students make these decisions, and the information is not easily available. And this is this has the possibility of doing that um, for for our students. You, um, this process is put back centered behind student, which means that we really need to make certain that our that the work that we do is student centered. And so I want to thank you for the work that you've done. Thank you. Board Member Dalili, followed by Board Member Baum. Thank you. First off, I wanted to thank you for your presentation. Uh, personally, I work in the Office of Outreach and School Relations at El Camino, so some of the problems that you addressed, I witness firsthand uh, almost every day, and uh, it's very accurate. Uh, I just had a question on something that was touched on a little bit, and I wanted to know what the relationship between the Guided Pathways Project and placement tests are. Um, going back a couple slides, on um, have you heard these student stories? The first one is of a student who took intermediate algebra in high school and now they have to start in a basic math course. And personally, my school, 84% uh, of students start off in basic skills. Um, so basically, in your eyes, what is the solution and what is the partnership between guided pathways and placement tests and these issues that come from it? So um, two points in response. The first one, if you ask the question, what does the Guided Pathways Framework do? The Guided Pathways Framework would ask that college, are you recognizing all of the students, what, what the student has learned, so that the student can start at the right place and make progress? So it's not a punitive approach. It's an approach of clarity. Do you know what the student knows? And are you placing? So the, the question is asked to the college. And so then, then now I go to, go to point number two, and I can talk about Bakersfield College. So at BC, we used to have a single placement test uh, called Compass. And the student would come to the college and take Compass. And it was, you know, the, the number of students who placed into college level was abysmal. So what we did initially about three years ago was to make it portable, AccuPlace, and we took it out to the high school. We noticed right away when the student was taking the placement test at the high school, they placed far better because they were in an environment that they were comfortable. And then we went into multiple measures. Now we've moved to multiple measures, which is 
using the student's GPA. And that also tr translates not just for high school students, but also veterans. When they come back, how does the institution, so Guided Pathways demands that an institution, and I appreciated um, uh, board member um, Haynes's comment that faculty are at the core of this work. Because when you're talking about recognizing uh, that experience that a veteran may have and recognizing that learnings to put them in the right path in their trajectory is critical. So the demand is we need to get really clear on that. So it, it's beyond just, um, just a high school. So we have moved completely to multiple measures, which includes the GPA. All right, board member Baum. Just want to thank you for the presentation. This is a huge step forward in uh, doing what matters for student success, and I, I appreciate that. Specifically, my question is the $150 million earmarked in the budget uh, proposal, what would that specifically be used for? What do we anticipate that being used for? And then I saw that they, there was a lot of technology uh, that would be helpful in, in making those pathways clear to students, but Obviously, a lot of students also still need that person, that one-on-one -on -one interaction with a faculty or a counselor or an advisor. Um, how will we in increase the number of, of, of individuals, people who are available to our students uh, in, in serving them? But where would the money go? Member Baum, let me take that question, because um, I'm sure Sonia will say it should just go to Bakersfield College. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> which I wouldn't necessarily disagree with, but uh, just kidding. Um, uh, we are obviously, uh, as uh, Vice Chancellor Rodriguez stated, that there will be trailer bill language. We are hoping to sit down with finance to talk to them specifically about the kind of flexibility we'd like to have. There are, colleges are at varying levels of development in terms of this approach. Some colleges, Bakersfield College, for example, is well along the line in terms of having these discussions on campus, bringing people together. Some colleges haven't even thought about this approach. Some colleges are just now experimenting with this approach. So we would want the flexibility to be able to bring um, varying levels of colleges who want to engage in this approach along and provide them professional development, provide them access to perhaps coaches who understand how this approach works. Um, um, give them uh, some uh, funding so that they can do some of the things that uh, uh, President Christian discussed. Uh, so we would want as much flexibility as possible. And again, this funding would be for those colleges that want to participate uh, and want to take on this approach. And so it'll be there to help them develop the approach wherever they may be on the spectrum of uh, professional development. Thank you, Dr. Christensen. This is great. I mean, I've been to your campus a couple of times, so welcome to Sacramento to, to the board meeting. So thank you for that. Um, my question is, you know, how can we as a board help you and uh, help this, uh, this concept of what you're bringing to the table? How can we help you? Well, that's a hard question, and I want to get it right. So I'm going to ask you, I'm going to try attempting to answer it, but I want to come back and I'll write something to Chancellor Oakley to, to give you uh, after I've given it some thought. Um, but I want to go back to um, something that Chancellor Oakley talked about, and that is um, we need to empower colleges to really take on this responsibility with a ferociousness like we've never seen before. And I don't know necessarily that, you know, someone mentioned, you know, getting reports, to, you know, doing tons of reports and the bureaucracy is not necessarily the manner to do that. Um, I think we need to create the condition um, and not accept anything less, you know, create the condition for those discussions to happen. I would also say that from my own experience as a math faculty and now as president, that if you look at, if every, everyone likes looking at the, uh, referring to the bell curve, I would say that 
most community college folks want to make sure that students learn that they are great communicators, they're critical thinkers, they're creative, and they get a job that can sustain their family, okay? I would say the majority of us want to do that. But often we come into a system that we're just doing what everyone else does. And it's almost now that you as a board have over the last four years invested systematically in different parts of this large ship. You've invested in matriculation, you've invested in uh, the ADT transfers, which by the way has done phenomenal. We've increased our transfer rate of those students that come from Arvin and Lamont and to Cal State phenomenally. Uh, our strong workforce, you know, and the emphasis. Um, but I think a part of how we react to it is with a sense of bureaucracy. And, and it's the mind shift of, of letting loose on the bureaucracy, but really calling on that innate intelligence um, to, to be able to integrate our work. I'm just now using too many words, so I will stop right there. But it's a great question. I'll think about it. Thank you. So um, I'll, I'll take the chair's prerogative and, and say again, thank you both for your presentation. Um, what struck me about so much of the comment back and forth, and Chancellor Oakley, your framing of the conversation as well, is that the theme of integration and intent is critical to this. And this notion that, that President Christian mentioned that we've invested in so many pieces of the ship, right? This calls to uh, mind the importance of leadership. This pathways, guided pathways, is one way to project a vision of how you achieve um, those outcomes for every student that comes into our system. It's one way of organizing your brain around it, but it takes leadership to do that, right? It takes leadership to look at all these disparate pieces of investment and frame it around a central outcome. And I loved your four pillars, and, and I, I also appreciated your article. I thought it was great. It was relentlessly clear and repetitive with its, if it's, its analogy, but that's what it needed. Um, so I guess what I wanted to state about this is there are probably other ways to organize all of these investments. This one's very compelling. We may not like single, you know, one-year investments, but we might get $150 million. So the way that you answer board member Avis's question when you go back to Bakersfield and think about it, I think we would appreciate knowing if you were in our shoes and there was 150 or some, some much amount of money that has to go system-wide, what's the best way of injecting that to let a thousand flowers bloom, right? Because at the end of the day, what this board needs to be able to do is empower great leaders. And you have really projected great leadership just in this presentation. So how do we do that instead of like, okay, what we demand is more reports. It's probably not what this board wants to do, but what is the way that you encourage from a statewide policy level, great leadership? So I will leave you with that. I want to again thank you for your presentation. Um, and now I'm going to turn to my board members and just tell you a couple things. It is now 3.35. We will definitely get through the streamlining curriculum approval process. We will definitely get through board reports because I'm going to ask you to only report if you have something you absolutely need to report. And then we're going to end today because the remainder of the agenda is really going to be tomorrow where we have people coming in. So we can't take anything else even though we may have some extra time. So my question to my board members are, do you want to take a five minute break or do you want to power through? Five minute break, I'm holding you to it, okay? I'm holding you to it. All right, so we'll be back at 3.40. Thank you.